All right. Welcome to the podcast, Coach Rob Beams, mate, all the way from the USA. I'm glad you made the trip to get here and uh, and jump on the podcast. Uh, thank you so much for having us. It's uh, it's a privilege. It's been forever since I've seen you, so it's good to be back. Yeah. So we were sort of talking in the car on the way to the from the airport that we've got all of these different six degrees of separation of people we know and, yep. and uh, like really good friends. So my one of my best friends Wes Williams is a guy that you know very well you're very highly regarded by him by David Isaac Kevin Kelly so with anyone that comes with such a good recommendation from those people then instant family as far as I'm concerned so I, I appreciate it those guys like you say they are family you know we go back in so many different directions but uh there's so much overlap in the gray zones behind the scenes that people don't know and see. Mm. That's what I think is so cool. Yeah, for sure. So you guys are over here for uh, school. So you're, uh, it's kind of, you do so much stuff, I guess for the audience will break down sort of what you do day to day, the businesses that you run sure. and then what you're here for. And then I guess we'll just kind of go on from there. No, sounds good. We, uh, we've been in the business for 35 years now doing uh, nutrition and performance programs for everybody that's in, if we always say if you have blood and you know, warm blood running through and you breathe oxygen, you're one of our clients. And we have what we call verticals. We have an endurance vertical, we have a motorsports division, then we have a speed and agility, ball and sports, ball and stick sports, and then we have our general fitness and weight loss. So it's something we've been doing for 35 years amongst all the different sports. And the thing that's so interesting is, you know, people don't realize how many athletes we're involved with because mm. their agents don't let us advertise them because we're an expense. If you think yeah. about an agent's role, an agent's going to be making a percentage on a Target deal, a Coke deal, or whatever it may be, where the athletes are paying us for those performance programs, we aren't really allowed to market. And yeah. even to this day, there's a lot of athletes that we work with in a lot of sports. So we're kind of the best kept secret. Yep. which kind of hurts the growth of the business in one way, but we can sleep at night knowing that we're really making a difference. It's interesting that you, we started to get, and maybe I guess it's like Troy Adamitis is like the guy that we could thank for that is because mm -hmm. you started seeing Alden pop up everywhere. And I guess the media started to focus attention on these kind of like trainers of the stars sort of deal. But I always did wonder that, like if you're paying somebody mm -hmm. every month, then, you know, it's sort of, you don't want them to be marketing yeah. themselves as well in a way like that. There, there is like a weird line between that, right? It's, it's more difficult than people realize because when you, you know, like you said, it's morphed quite a bit to the point now where obviously there's teams that have their own designated trainers mm. at their facilities. Um, whether it's territorial in a geographical area, whether it's in a physical facility and it's difficult because the trainer is responsible for the health and the wellness and the performance of that athlete. Mm. But at the same time, you've got the responsibilities of the team and all that goes with it. So where does that gray line come into where if the athlete doesn't perform well, it's always the trainer's fault. Mm. You know, like the first year we had Dungey and he went to the KTM from Suzuki. So you've got a bike that can turn on a dime, goes through the whoops like a bow and arrow, goes to the KTM at that time was a stink bug in the whoops. Well, obviously the athlete's not going to be fit enough because we got smoked by Villapoto, mm. who'd been on a K, you know, been on the Cowie for three years and just blazed right through it. It's very easy to be the fall guy, mm. and and a lot of people don't understand that, you know, because when I'm working with an athlete, and and if you watch the CBS special, you hear me say I don't live in a world of emotions. I live in a world of zeros and ones, mm. and they really really focused on that. It's the truth. I don't really care what your last name is. I don't care what sport we're involved with. I will only make a decision based on how your body's responding. Mm. And without getting into a bunch of physiology, your body, well, you've got the background. You're either in a mode of anabolic growth, improvement. A lot of people think steroids when we talk anabolic, or you're in a catabolic breakdown mode. Mm. It's real easy for me to come in and just make you work out to the point that you're extremely sore. And you can't be in both, right? You cannot be in yeah. both. Because I was listening to a podcast with... Um, was actually a Rogan one. Uh, what's the guy's name? He does a lot of the weight cutting stuff for fighters. Gotcha. And and he was talking about that where there's people now that are saying like you can be in both and that's where you need to be. And yeah. it's like, well, how? No. You're either growing or you're deteriorating, really, right? Well, and I I, I kind of get teased to be in the 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 Sheldon from you know Big mm. Bang Theory. David David Iser came up with that. 
to me, everything is analytical zeros and ones. And you said it best. You can't have a number going up and down simultaneously. Yeah. And if you say, yes, you can. Well, okay, let's say a negative one, positive one is what? Zero. Zero. Yeah. Exactly. So if you want to say you can have two simultaneously running, great. But then I always say it this way. Like I'm not into calorie counting. But then when somebody is, and then I use the math to maybe invalidate a concern that they have, mm. then they immediately want to try to say, well, that's not the way I'm looking at it. I'll give you an example. Somebody steps on the scale in on Monday, and let's just say for even numbers, they're 150 pounds. They step on the scale on Tuesday and they're 153. Well, they'll say, see, I got fatter. Well, there's roughly 3,500 calories. That's not an actual number, but let's say it's 3,500 calories. Well, did you really eat over 10,000 calories to get that three pounds of body fat that you're telling mm. me that you got? And then they say, no, 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 no. I myself, I use the scale every single day, but what we use it for is the, the measurement of inflammation and swelling. Mm. So you go do a jiu-jitsu class, you rip it up. Well, you're going to see an increase in body weight because it's the inflammation and swelling. Mm. So it's, see, I lose I lose a lot of weight mm -hmm. in uh, like per class in summer just through sweat. Sweat. That's so the like, other variable because I'll. Like, especially when you're training in the gi, yep. like that's a very thick, heavy fabric. Sure. And then you sweat into that big, heavy fat. It weighs like, it feels like it weighs four pounds extra. It does because it's, it's absorbing all that water. Yeah. And that's why we always say with our athletes, we look at what they weigh before and after every, every workout. We factor in how many ounces of fluid they took in and then we determine their perspiration rate. Mm. So what we do is we create temperature silos. So if you're in your class and let's say that you're in a 10 degree range, what we look at is what was the duration. We have all of our athletes wear a heart rate monitor. We mm. look at average heart rate, max heart rate, duration, heat, humidity, and you come up with a sweat rate. And that's where immediately people are like, oh, da 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 da, yeah, Rob's too, too complicated. Much, yeah. And I'm like, well, if you think that's too much, when you're you make it three quarters of the way through a fight, an event, a race, you're probably going to think, man, I should have known I that. wish I knew I exactly wish I knew how that. much I need to drink. And that's where I get kind of a bad rap, but a good rap. People know that what I do works, but not, and you know, I talked about this coming from the airport. A lot of people say they want to do it. Mm. Not really willing to do it when the push comes to shove. Yeah. Because it's going to require an attitude. It's going to require perspective change. It's going to require some trust. But we always say, if you understand the system and the process and you look at the results we've gotten, they're not going to be what you see mainstream. Yeah. Mainstream gives you mainstream results. And we're not like, there's some people out there, oh, you got to go gluten free, 100%. Well, I disagree unless you have celiac disease. Yeah. Now, has anyone ever said they felt worse going gluten free? No, but it's very complicated. And it's hard to stick to. Very hard to stick to, yeah. especially for these athletes that are traveling four days a week. Sustainability is, I think, one of the most like underrated yes. aspects of like, say if you're like right now, it's the 15th of January or the 13th or whatever yep. it is. And it's like we're right in that new year new me thing and it's like you can have all the best intentions in the world but if you can't figure out a way for something to be sustainable yep. and a part of your lifestyle like i think that that should be probably the thing that people put above everything else when it comes to starting a new thing or Absolutely. fitness or, or whatever and i've even i got a buddy that just started jiu-jitsu the other day and I was like, hey, man, how, how's your body? Are you sore? And he was like, no, nah, no, nah, I'm good. He's like, I'm going to go train twice tomorrow. And I'm like, all right. Big and mistake. then I, I text him the next day. I'm like, how are you feeling this morning? He's like, dude, I'm really sore. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, like there's, you have to be sustainable. I did it to myself this year. Sure. Like I got to a point where I was going so much that it was like diminishing returns because yeah. I was just fatigued, mentally yep. fatigued, physically fatigued. So like, yeah, I think that, yeah, that sustainability has to be, like paramount so like Absolutely. just say gluten-free sugar-free anything free is like that's a commitment in your life that you now have to make 100 percent, and that's a heavy commitment and then it comes with guilt when you break it that's right well and, and you bring up something two two thoughts right there first of all when, like when you had carry on and they were talking about the burnout factor mm. don't get need to get in the names and you know but the idea here is why are people who are young and should have a five six year career last two years it's not sustainable. Mm. And I'll argue this all day long. I'll get on, I'll get in a debate all day long. I have a responsibility for an individual's health, wellness, and then performance. You could say that's a textbook cliche. That's the mantra I live and die by. If I get terminated, which I have, if I get terminated because I'm not pushing somebody hard enough and I've shown you that your body can't take on incrementally more, if you want to terminate me on that, I sleep really good at night. Yeah. 
what I, what I, I, and I say this very humbly, I've never in 35 years have somebody never finish a race. I don't care if it's a marathon, a triathlon, or a motocross race, because they weren't able to sustain it. Mm. Now, what ends up happening is you get a lot of people that are armchair quarterbacks. Uh, I'm not going to name any names, but when you have somebody that steps in and goes, why aren't you doing this type of training? And that's why you're getting beat by another, and I'm going to just say Mm. it's in the sport of moto. You're getting beat by another rider because he's doing, and I'm going to be blunt, he's doing sprint work and you're not. And I say to you, your body, your biofeedback indicators are showing you've got signs of adrenal fatigue. Mm. You've got low sex drive. You've got night sweats. You can't sleep. You're craving simple sugars. This guy comes walking in from the left field and says, you got to be doing sprint work. And I'm, and I say to them as their human performance coach, if you start inc- implementing and, and putting in that much incremental load on the body, you're going to regress Yeah. to your point. It's not a sustainable effort that you can do. Well, that doesn't make me popular. Because when somebody's paying me to be a performance coach, it's like bust my balls, they break my back, right? And yeah. I'm saying to them, when the time comes, yeah. And but you- there's like there's a different starting point that everyone has, exactly. And like, let's say if it is like Villapoto Dungey, like they're not the same dude. No. They're trying to win the same race. That's right. But they're not the same dude. That's right. There's different. There's a whole lot of different shit going on physically, yep. mentally, like the way that they were brought up. Yeah. what they're exposed to as a kid you know what i mean like there's there's factors that go beyond i think especially in the the motocross world when it comes to fitness yeah is it's like we just expect that because they're on that main event 450 start line and they're both going for a race win yeah that they're doing they're the same thing they're just not the same no, thing like not there's even just, remotely close yeah there's just it's a very different um you know, you're just dealing with two different physiologies. Yeah. And I think a really good example of, um, like I love and respect Bobby Hewitt so much. Absolutely. I totally agree. He is such a, a, like a really good wise dude, in my opinion, for the way that he handled the Jason Anderson thing. Agreed. When Ando had those, those first few rounds and he was just nowhere, they didn't give up on him, but they didn't let him race. That's right. They sent him because home. Because they knew. That's right. They were like, man, if you keep racing mm-hmm. and you, you're, you're so far behind the eight ball yep. that if you try and play catch up at this stage, you're going to be done. Like this will, your career, like this could ruin your career. So then they just pulled him Yep. and they put him on the bench. We've never seen a team manager do that. And look at what we got last year. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) And I just, I love that. That's such a smart way to think about an athlete's, like you said, their well being first. Right. Because if you're performing it, if you're the best person you can be, you're in the best frame of mind, you're a healthy person. That's the building blocks for performance. Absolutely. Not, perform and then try and let everything else fall into place right well take what you just said right there and this is gets a little bit deep and i hope the i hope the listeners will really think about this i can go in and make the workout about me Mm. a true performance coach that cares about the individual is going to put his or her ego aside and say what is the best thing for this athlete the challenging part is if the athlete doesn't trust it or he gets all the little chirping Mm. birds in the corner who have no insight as to what's truly going on you go back real quick, you were talking about having two different athletes. If you know anything about physiology, there's a certain amount of load that we put the body under. Let's say it's X amount of hours per week. We break that up into percentage of aerobic and anaerobic on the bike, and we break it into anaerobic, aerobic, anaerobic off the bike. That cumulatively, that's what we get the idea of residual fatigue. Mm. When I was working with AC in the amateur ranks, and I had him all through his Cali career there, one of the things that ended up happening was somebody came to me after I lost him to Alden because a lot of people don't realize that he had signed that huge deal going mm. from super minis to the pro class. He had a chance to go train with Villapoto and Alda. And I said, AC, come on. I mean, it's an opportunity of a lifetime. You're training at the net when it's now known as the nest. Yeah, the nest yeah. yeah. So you can go train at the nest. You've got a full time facility. You're training with Villapoto, the best in the sport at the time. Don't be silly. And it, the, my point is, what ended up happening was as soon as he graduated, a gentleman contacted me and said, I will pay you five figures for AC's training program. That's crazy. And I had made a commitment to Alan C., his dad. I said, I will never sell Adam. No one will ever know what I did with Adam yeah. as an amateur, out of respect. But on the s- second side, to your point earlier, if I handed that training program over to somebody, what's the say? The kid could get yeah. crucified. Yeah. Adam C. and Cirilio, and I've said this on several you know, writing and articles and interviews, 
AC was by far the hardest worker I ever had. Mm. And this may sound crazy. The only other person that I would even put in the same category would be Ashley Filek when I worked with her with Honda. Oh, awesome. Incredibly oh, yeah. hard worker. Probably because she had to, you yeah. know. But the point is, is you remember Adam used to train with Zach Freeberg. Yeah. And we'd be sitting there and we'd be doing, doesn't matter what, static wall squats or whatever. And AC would just look at him and say, you hurting? Zach's like, oh, I'm dying. He goes, good. Because I'm going to win. Mm. And that little guy would sit there. I mean, you got to remember, Zach's six foot four, you know, and there he's got a little AC on an eight. And AC's net, he's not a physically imposing dude. Like, even now, he still looks Absolutely. goofy. Absolutely. He's certainly not the most intimidating he's guy. He's got a Jar Jar Binks physique. <laughs> but that heart. Yeah. And I always say, I can never cultivate that tiger in the belly, that yeah. fire in the belly, but I can cultivate and drive the efforts. And I'm not the most popular because I do err on the side of caution. I'm going to be more of an aerobic enhancement guy than an anaerobic. And some people say, oh, see, Coach Rob doesn't understand moto because it's an anaerobic threshold sport. That's total BS. I get it. Trust me. We have our heart. We, we download our heart rate monitors after every single riding session. I understand. I've been doing it for 35 years. I've got world champions in every sport we do. But I'm not going to just be another riding coach that's out there saying just push it just push mm. it just put that's not what i'm paid to do sustainability now if that means that i have to have an athlete that the best his body can do right now and i'm not i got to be very careful because we'll pick athletes up that come from other programs mm. i've got to clean up what's already been done yeah at the same time try to create some improvement and create sustainability so that means i may only be able to develop someone into a top three guy and never a champion but to take them into that extra 1%, I could take them from a six-year career down to 18 months or even two years. We've mm. seen it in the last couple of years. That's a shame to me. And the the thing is, too, is like as a trainer, when you talk about the people that kind of come back and it, you, you often become like the fall guy, yeah. you're not with them 24-7 That's right. as well. That's right. And it's like I've been at dinners with riders where they're like, ah, oh, fuck, uh, I'm just going to eat it. I know Alden doesn't want me to or like don't tell Alden I'm doing this mm -hmm. don't tell Alden we went out tonight so it's like you can be Alden Baker the best trainer in the world and the best resume yep and like if his dude's gonna go home and eat food that he doesn't want him to eat and like not give a fuck yep then it's like that's that's not out of your control it's like just because you're a trainer that's getting paid to train these guys doesn't mean that you're getting everything from them and like perfect example um like phil nicoletti yep right Filthy phil love the dude he's yeah. a fucking he's legend awesome. but so we're at the martin's place and we yep. were filming some stuff with them and jeremy and alex and phil went on a mountain bike ride mm -hmm. and phil like cartwheeled went over the bars come back and it's like i'm not doing that last lap he's like i'm fucked wouldn't do it the martin boys did it mm -hmm. who's won titles that's it and it's not a knock on phil but there is this it has to come within you can be like Phil is on the same program. He's doing the same thing. Yep. But then you're not getting the same result. That's right. Brock Tickle was on the Alden program yep. or, you know, Jake Weimer was on mm -hmm. the, Al you, he was on the same bike as Villapoto. He was on the same program as Villapoto. Like no one then criticized Alden because Jake Weimer didn't do good. Right. You know, so it but, is, a, and, but it had neither one of those riders on that team gotten it. Then Alden one and got crucified. Mm. That's where it's interesting. As long as you have one mm -hmm. diamond in the rough, you're, you're gold. Yeah. And you know, like we, I, I worked with Jeremy and Alex when they were amateurs and uh, they had a three man team out of the Millville and it was uh, Spencer Daly, Alex and Jeremy Martin. And we used to call him germ, you know, germs on an 85 we go on bike rides and Alex is like, we're going to destroy him. You know, we look back and he's a mile back and I'm in a quandary because here I am. Because he was pretty fat back then. He's a fat little yeah. kid, you know, and he'll tell you that. Yeah. And, but Germ had that fire that AC has that yeah. he'd be back there literally in tears, but he's going to finish that ride. Yeah. And if you've been around Millville, you know that there's some good hills around that yeah. area. And I just remember coming back because uh, Mr. Martin had flown me up and we did it kind of like a boot camp at the Millville track. And, I just remember saying to myself, there's just something about Germ. Alex is a, I mean, Alex is a pit bull in a fight. I mean, he's just a great kid, very smart, but something about Germ. There's just, there was always that belly. And when I was working with Dungey, it was great because Dungey was a 450 rider there and Germ was there as a 250 rider. So we got to rub elbows again because I live in Orlando and I'd go up and I'd live with Dungey for four days a week. And then I'd go back home because I had two little guys at home. Oh, nice. And it was the first time I'd ever been away from my boys. But to me, I thought it was an investment, yeah. uh, you know, in our, in our business. I wanted to, 
Dungey was kind of in a dark spot physically and what he was dealing with. And, you know, I just felt it was the right thing to do. And uh, they just always knew there was something about Germ. So to see him go on to number one, and then now to see Alex over at JGR, you know, in the last couple of years, it have been good for Alex versus yeah. working out of a box van, you know, eating mac and cheese and vans breaking down every three hours, you know. But that's the stuff behind the scenes that you nobody yeah, understands. Yeah, and you can't teach that. And then you, it's real hard to tell people, like, that's right. this is this guy has this thing. That's right. They have that thing. And, and you know, you can see it in every sport. You can just see those guys. You're just like, he's a fucking psycho. Yeah. Like Toby Price. The guy's a psychopath. Absolutely. A straight psychopath. Like one of my friends, Andrew, he uh, he does jiu-jitsu with me. He was an amateur boxer. And now he does jiu-jitsu. And okay. He's a, he's a killer. And uh, he was... Toby was at our place the other day and then Andrew's there and they'll just sort of talk and Toby's not the kind of guy that's going to be like, oh, I'm do, I do the sure, Dakar. Sure. Like, didn't say anything, just literally sitting there watching TV and Andrew's like prying all this info out of him and then Toby's there slowly going, ah, oh, do this and then, and Andrew's like, oh, you, you breezed over that bit about racing in the desert for two weeks. Right. He's like, what is that? What's that race? And mm-hmm. he's not a motorsport sure, guy. Sure, sure. So he's just asking him those questions and he's just going, you're a fucking psycho. Absolutely. He's like, you're a psycho. <laughs> and then he's like, pull it, pull it up. Let's watch it on TV. So we, we had the TV going. He's like, oh, you do. He's like, he just couldn't get his head around yeah. the physically what he can do. And right now, Toby's in Dakar with, a, he broke his scaphoid three weeks ago. Oh man. And he's at day he's five there. of the Dakar. He's in third place. There's just that special thing yep. that some dudes have yep. where they just don't care. They're just going to do it. Absolutely. And you could, it, you know, you, whether you're the best trainer in the world, it's just some, those guys will find their way yep. to the top, you know? Well, and, and it's interesting because in our performance model that we utilize, we don't just take one sliver. We look at food, we look at hydration, yeah. we look at sweat rate, we look at, like I said, aerobic, anaerobic, on and off the bike. We look at flexibility, functional range of motion, and then we wrap it up with the mental aspects of it. Because if you come in tired, hungry, dehydrated, fati- overly fatigued, we're you know, the skies open up and the, the mental edge is yeah, gone. Exactly. You know, just the smallest little thing just sends yep. him off the deep end. Yep. Then all of a sudden now the trainer's being blamed that he's overtrained, but he missed two flights, had two red eyes and was just able to get to the race. Well, I don't control the airlines, mm-hmm. but we get blamed for that. Yeah. So one of the things you got to keep in mind as well, let's take a, a pro motocross guy. Let's say he is able to fly home on Sunday. I've only got Monday through Wednesday, maybe Thursday if they don't have to do media day. Well, I'm anticipating his load levels on a because I write all my schedules and I send them to my athletes on Friday, mm. but I write them off of the biofeedback because I log into their heart rate data every day. Um, we have our athletes wear something called the Aura Ring, which is the recovery ring that's come out. It gives you your heart rate variability. It gives you sleep quality. It gives you things. Can you wear that ring to get your heart rate? Yes, you can, but we use it for sleep. I've been really interested in some heart rate stuff for yep. training, but I can't wear a heart rate monitor. Well, some of the new monitors actually rate it off the back of your wrist. They use a three. They oh, use, but I can't wear anything when I train. Yeah, so then you wouldn't be able to, but you can, can you wear do, the ring. You could wear yeah. the ring and it, it's accurate for it, your heart rate. It's very accurate. Oh, now, we see, use it for cool. sleep because some people don't like to sleep with the watch, which yeah. is fine. But now some of the new heart rate monitors have the sleep variability as well. Mm. But the takeaway in all of that is you have to understand I'm speculating you know, if I've got a rider that's got to go to Toyota of Escondido, do a signature, has got to go do yeah. a photo shoot. I mean, obviously I'm exaggerating. You're not doing a photo shoot the week yeah. before Supercross, but I've got to guesstimate what's the extra load over and above training. Yeah. How many hours in a plane? Because they know? don't live in a vacuum. That, it's that. You know? It's the glass house syndrome yeah. that I refer to. People say, well, they should be, the word should is the most asinine thing I've ever heard because I'm anticipating the flight to XYZ is going to be X hours. Don't always work out that way food that you know being exposed to a, a coughing kid in the back seat and now all of a sudden you've got germs you know i mean let's face it a plane's a flying petri dish to begin with yeah so what i'm what i'm trying to get at though is i can anticipate that the athlete's going to get seven to eight hours of sleep and he runs four hours for three days it's it's kind of like having a motor that's got 300 hours and you're pushing it aside saying yeah i've got my championship bike it's tired it's tattered mm. and i always try to draw the parallels we we kiss the tail ends of motors but then when it comes to the physiology of a human, we're like, suck it up, buttercup. You should be able to do that. I'm like, really? Yeah. He's got black circles under his eyes. He's not sleeping good. He's got night sweats. And it can come on just like that. But if you, this is where people say you overanalyze it. And I'm like, it's amazing to me. You go and you buy but you a measure motor. a valve 
clearance to like a thank thousandth you. of a thank of you. a millimeter. That's it. But what's the difference? I mean, look at between, the summer that Mitch's yeah. bikes, two different riders, bike blew up in two different races because they're that minutely on, on the, the edge. edge. And you and you they can't, accept it. They accept it if it's a motor, but if the rider, and it's interesting because when I, we were talking about earlier about sweat rate, the athletes look at it and go, "Man, it's such a pain in the ass. I got to weigh myself without my gear. Then I got to put my gear on. And then when I get it out of my gear, I'm like, dude." Stepping on a scale before you get geared up and stepping on a scale after, if that's going to rock your world, good luck. This sport's hard enough as it is. It's harder to measure sag. We yeah. do that before every rod. Thank you. I, these are the kinds of things I always try to draw parallels mm. on. I'm like, you guys can tell me where this motor creates peak horsepower, your, what your counter sprocket is, what your rear sprocket is, pipe setting, days when we had carbs, you had carbs. You gave me all the settings. And I said, well, what's your rider's max heart rate? And they go, I don't know. You're too complicated. Mm. Well, who the hell's riding the motorcycle? Not a monkey. But that's where this and, and, and like anything, it goes paradigm shifts. You have the trainers that I mean, let's face it, 95 percent of the trainers that are out there are not trainers. They're ex riders. Mm. That's like I say all the time. I have a 250F. I read the manual. Should Mitch, should Bobby, should yeah. you know, should somebody hire me because, you know, should Ziggy pick me up because I read my manual? Mm. But because I used to ride for a factory team, now I know everything about nutrition. I understand glycogen synthase enzyme. I understand lactic acid, VO2 max calculation. Mm. I can go on all kinds of big terms. Yeah. But when the athlete, but it's easy for a trainer to come in, and we hear it all the time, no gluten. And ask the trainer why. You don't have celiac disease. Oh, we're not going to have any simple sugars. Okay. I understand it in theory, but if you're burning 7,000 calories in a training session. Dude, that's what. You got to get it. That's the thing, like, it's it's funny, and I don't want to just keep turning the whole podcast back to me training or whatever, no, please, but it's, yeah. it's, in, it's interesting to me because I, and I guess for, for listeners as well, to give context, like, I've been around these guys, like, I would film, yeah, and I've filmed yeah, every yeah. workout, I've filmed every ride, like, but I've never been in a situation where I've trained mm-hmm. as hard as that, or I've had you know, physical goals and things that, sure. uh, that I've gone to in my sport to where like, I really never could relate. Mm-hmm. And I, and I could, I could think I related because I raced my whole life, but I never put in real effort into training. I never, I never was consistent enough with hard training to see sleep patterns to like now, like I have days where I'll be sitting at my desk and mm-hmm. I know I've got training at five yeah, and I'll be like, fuck, I'm dehydrated. Yeah, like I can feel You're that I, behind. I'm like, and I can't catch that That's up. That's right. And I run down the store and I drink a two liter coconut water and yep. like hope that it does something. But yep. it's like, you know, I think that the more you get into something or like maybe the sharper your blade gets, the mm-hmm. more you train, the more you sort of understand, the more data you collect about yourself, the more yep. you can relay them back to like, okay, that was good training, that was bad training. Yeah, you sort of do start the. It's like the picture starts to un you know, become unfoggy and you're like, Absolutely. Oh, this is a, this is a whole thing yep. now. And, and I know like today, I, this morning, man, I just felt like shit. Yeah. Like I, I had this week off cause I hurt my elbow. I, I trained yesterday morning. I wasn't eating right all week because I wasn't having to go to training. Sure. So I was like, eh, I, I don't really need to feel good. Yep. But after a few days I wake up and I just feel like a sack of shit. Yeah. You know? So it's like you've, there is this really big part of the picture and now i know like just from this week again it's like that more data i'm like like we're moving house next week and Mm -hmm. i'm not gonna not gonna be around like the personal chef like sure sure. yeah so i'm like all right i'm really gonna have to put effort into my food and i'm gonna i really am gonna have to start trying to step stuff up again yeah because i'm asking x for my body and i'm just not giving it enough whether it's sleep hydration you know, we get into summer and all of a sudden now the water that you drank in winter, mm-hmm. you're sweating double. Yep. So it's like, but are you making allowances for that stuff or are you just doing the same That's routine? It. Like there's so much that, that goes into it. Like you're Absolutely. saying to that comparison between a, yeah. a motor, because yeah, you're right. My dad will sit in the shed and he measures our valve tolerances mm-hmm. to the thousandth of a millimeter. And if he's off. And then bang. Boom, it's a bloated mo- yeah. you know, blown up motor. And we, we're like, we, we're like, oh, that makes sense. Sure. Well, in the, in the, I always say this, and I've, I've yet to get the exact number. I don't know how many total moving parts are in a motorcycle by the time it takes suspension, motor, chassis, mm. the whole nine yards. And yet when I start talking about things that people just don't understand, glycogen synthesis enzyme and things like that, they immediately close their mind. And I'm like, I don't know anything that, I, I pale in comparison to what Bones Bacon knows at Pro Circuit. Yeah. We all know him, he's just a suspension guru. But- 
if he starts saying something to you, do you just plug your ears and go, I don't care what he says. Yeah. That's the part that kind of annoys me because, and I hate to say this, but any of the listeners whose parents have been a moto dad, the answer is stiffer, stiffer suspension, faster motors. Yeah. That's always the answer to everything. And all that does is bring out all the bad. Yeah. Because if the bike's faster and it's stiffer, it's just going to beat the rider down quicker. Then the dad just yells, I invested all this money and you suck. Yeah. It's kind of like the camp we're here to do in Australia. The idea is what we do differently is we say, look, you're riding a moving gyroscope. The bike's got a front and a back, a top and a bottom and a left and a right. Well, that's how we look at the human body. You got a left leg, a right leg, a front and a back and a top and a bottom. So if your functional strength and flexibility isn't there off the bike, what do you think is going to happen when you, let's say you double the speed of your motorcycle because you bought a new motor and you got stiffer suspension and it beats your teeth in through the whoops and rhythm sections and you wonder why you got slower instead of faster? Because you're putting your effort in the wrong area. Not because I don't own mm. a motor company, but who's riding the bike? Mm. That's the part that frustrates me. You know, and in speaking specifically of motocross, it's the only sport where these riders are expected to be on their game, not even at a professional level, amateur level. They're supposed to be on 48 weeks a year. Well, you have to be because the consequences are so high. Yeah, but that's what's like so you silly. You take the race, you take even just the racing side out of it. And yeah. this is what freaks me out now. Yep. And why I don't really ride that much is like, you just can die. Like mm-hmm. people die yeah. all the because time. I've mistake. had friends die yeah. and that bike just killed them. Absolutely. And it's like they got on and they thought they were going for a ride. Yep. And like I'm really close with Andrew McFarlane. Oh. I was filming the day, mm-hmm. like I was very like 20 meters from him when he died. Unbelievable. And it was like, that's one of the best dudes yep. to ever do it. Yep. And, and to me, yeah, like it, it really, it, it rattled me, but it's like, you're right there is this expectation like every time you get on that bike as fun as it is yep. and as much as we all love it like there's some serious consequences Absolutely. so like to you saying like whether you're pro or not yep like you need to be on like when you put that helmet on yeah like, well and how many guys together. how many guys have you talked to that blew themselves out blew a knee out mm. it was that one lap that one other that one extra riding session they were going to kick in yeah and we say this all the time and i don't mean to get highly technical on the show but you know the we take lap times and we correlate it against heart rate. And what people don't realize is we correlate it against blood sugar levels. There's a direct correlation. As blood sugar drops, lap times get slower. that's basically energy, right? It's energy and your ability to eye-hand coordinate. So when you see somebody coming in and they start missing their marks, instead of, instead of rolling through the corner that they've been doing for the last 12 minutes, all of a sudden they come in and make it a four-point turn because they're bouncing mm. off the corner, you kind of realize it started back in the rig where they weren't eating complex carbohydrates, weren't maintaining stabilized, excuse me, maintaining hydration levels. Their blood sugar is not stabilized for the duration of the race, whether it's Loretta's in a 20 or outdoors at, you know, 30 plus two. That's where training comes man, in in mathematics. Makes, it makes so much sense because like how many dudes have you heard that they're like, man, that guy on the practice track is like the best dude ever. Can't touch him. But then you get to the race and he can't do it. And yes. it's like, but how many dudes do you also know that get so nervous on race day they don't eat? Yes. And I say this all the time. I'm, I'm so glad you said that. When somebody comes to me, especially these little guys, and they're like, I just, I get too nervous. Uh, yeah. I got so many, like my buddy Azza, yeah. I went and did the World Vets with him a couple of years ago. He won the 40 plus class. Yep. Doesn't eat on race day. Yeah. He's like, oh, I just get too nervous. I'm like, dude, you can't not eat. Well, and what I always say to the rider that says that is it's like, it's like you coming, let's say you hire me as your mechanic for the day. And I just say to you, I just really don't want to fill your gas tank up. Yeah. I just don't feel like, dude, I, it just doesn't move. Me. I get I so wanna, nervous. I get so nervous. I, get, I, can't, I can't pick it up. Yeah, I, I, I stutter and I drop it up. all over. Yeah. You look at it and you go, well, tough, get it done. And, you know, we, we own our own motocross amateur team. And what we do is we, we go out and we search for athletes across off-road, supercross, the whole nine yards. And what we do is we look for riders that are outside the top 10. And the reason why I bring it up in this context is when we get them, and usually these are the kids that are trying to break into the top 10. So they kind of have a different kind of stress because, mm. you know, they're lining up to guys that they know are running full factory bikes. You yeah, know, they're already we like all know a little bit from super minis there. all the yeah. way up. We know that they're running full factory equipment. What we say to them is you have to train yourself to eat. Mm. You know, we do a lot with triathletes. So if we're we would just came back from Ironman Hawaii. And if you've ever spent any time over there, you know, the lava fields are not nice to anybody. But if you're going to get off the bike after biking 112 miles and run a marathon, you're going to have to deal with sloshy gut, disturbed gut, you know, but yet motocross goes, nope, um, we're just, we, we have pre-race nerves. We can't do that. Mm. Don't buy it. Train yourself to the specificity of what you're going to race. Are you going to be really surprised 
in the first week of August that it's going to be 100 plus degrees and 100 percent humidity, and you're going to do three 20 minute motos over five days and two classes, and you get there and go, wow, it's hot. Yeah, no you, shit, it's hot. Yeah, are you kidding me? And it you, isn't you, a surprise. Yeah, exactly. It's hot every year. Yes, it's like saying worst surprise it rains at Seattle. I mean, you're not going to go practice in the mud, but we know what Seattle is going to look like, and then everybody bitches on the results. It's the same thing with Loretta's, and I. But that's where I don't. That's where I fall out of popularity with the parents because mm. I say. Well, it's, it's not what I say. It's the truth. It takes six months to build an aerobic engine in a muscular base of strength. The muscles that you have sitting on your body is a byproduct of what you've eaten for the last six months. Hmm. So to be ready in Loretta's in August, you don't wait till June. It starts in January. Yeah. And what ends up happening is, and no disrespect to any facilities, we've got our logo on a couple of facilities in the States, but we always say, if you can go long and we call it long and slow, then you can go short and fast. Mm. Because if you understand capillary beds and the delivery of oxygen and dissipation of lactic acid and all this, again, maybe more technical than the show needs to hear about. It's I think, don't be scared to go technical though, cool. because like if anyone wants to, and like I often do this in podcasts, I'll yeah. pause, I'll write some notes cool. and I'll do a little bit of research. So don't, cool. I mean, I guess maybe put in layman's terms, but you know, use some sure. of those terms for people to do their own cool. research. Cause I do like to go back and do that stuff. Well, here's the thing. When you look at the, the roots of a bed, excuse me, the roots of a tree, you know, that's where it's getting its water and its nutrients from the dirt. When you go out and you do these, what we call boring aerobic exercises, let's take motocross, for example, I'll have my guys go out for a 90 minute bike ride and heart rate zone two or below. You can't go mm. too easy. What that does is that increases the presence and the delivery excuse me, the growth of the capillary beds in that lean muscle tissue. So then when it comes time when we get into sprint work, you've built the channels to get the oxygen into the working muscles, the lactic acid out of the muscles efficiently. So now you can handle a higher level of speed for a longer period of time. Mm. But unfortunately, when these racers are only doing sh you know, short sprint racing from essentially November through June, by the time you go Minios, Daytona, Freestone, area regional, maybe Mammoth, and then you're at Loretta's, a lot of the facilities say, oh, now we're going to start doing longer motos. That, that ship has sailed. Mm. You're going to do nothing but take a tired, tattered body into Loretta's. But they say, well, we had to do our Loretta with motos. You should have been doing this stuff in January, February. Now we're getting into periodization. We're getting into the true physiology. And people go, that is way too complicated. I just need him to win this weekend. I get that at some level. But if you're training to go long and slow, let's take a professional motocross guy. I don't do anything special for Supercross. He needs to be training for outdoors. Why? Because if he can go three 30-minute motos in training, he, he damn can sure do can do laps. 20 laps when it's 62 degrees and low humidity. Mm. You know, we we currently do some work with the, the amateurs at Ricky's place. And we train for Loretta's, at, you know, right after many O's. Mm. But people don't understand that. They don't like to hear it. And they're like, oh, man, we got such a, you know, so much work there. Well, where do you, what are you training for? It goes back to the specificity of it. And it's kind of like the camp that we're doing here in Australia. When somebody comes in and the rider can't keep their boot high enough, that's more of a functional strength and flexibility issue of hip flexors, the hip. not them being belligerent saying, I just don't want to, you know, I, I love dabbing my foot. I love to blow my ACL, MCL. Really? Mm. Has anybody ever said that? Yeah. But then a riding coach just yells at him and says, get your boot Get your up. leg up. Yeah. We look at it. That's the way we design the camp. We do a classroom environment for an hour, and then we take you out to the, the track and we show you what we're talking about. And we come back in, do I care if you're holding one finger or two finger on the brakes? No. Nah. That's between you and your dad or your riding coach or whatever. I just want them to understand you've got a moving gyroscope, as we alluded to earlier, with a body that is in a three-dimensional plane. Mm. You've got to have your functional strength and your endurance relevant to what you're gonna go do. We mm. mentioned earlier, we do some stuff with some professional wakeboarders. Well, they're same three-dimensional plane. Yes, we do a lot on the trampoline before we get to the water. When we get to the water, they've gotta already have the established speed, strength, and flexibility to do it. You know this better than anybody, you've been around the sport. I can do a lot of anaerobic threshold, zone four or five work on a concept two rower, an erg, or whatever. That's a lot safer then going out and trying to do an anaerobic threshold on a 450. Mm. Now, I'm not saying that the cross training replaces the motorcycle, but if I've got an identified physical weakness, we call them energy systems from aerobic to anaerobic threshold. If we know that that's, let's say you can't, you don't have that opening lap speed, then we got an, we need to work on AT, that opening sprint speed. I'd rather work that on a rower, where I'm not mm. worried about you yard darting yourself, goes back to the sustainability. Yeah, it's just a safer way yes. to build up to it. Now, when we go and we say we're gonna go to the track, remember I said earlier, 
we know on Friday what we're going to do next week. So if I know next Tuesday and next Saturday's workouts on the track are going to be really anaerobic threshold focus, I'm not busting your balls off the motorcycle and bringing a tattered body to that session. Mm. I'll say this kind of as an example. We see athletes train too hard on their easy days, leaves them flat for their quality days, so their net gain is back to the plus one, minus one, Mm. zero. But they've got a bunch of check boxes on their training logs. The trainer's happy because he's screaming and yelling at them. I got him to eat this and not do that. I liked what you said. I hope I've never had an athlete feel like they couldn't eat something. Mm. If you watch that CBS podcast or show, they one of the things they honed in on was when I asked Ryan, did you eat your ice cream? So I got known as the, the coach that promotes ice cream. And of course they want to they want to railroad me and say, oh, it's yeah. got sugar in it. Well, when you understand the only thing that satisfies appetite is fat and protein. And when you go to sleep at night and your body releases HGH and testosterone, the two natural hormones that you need to get leaner and increase your aerobic function, I need you to go to bed quickly, i.e. I, fall asleep quickly, sleep deeply, and then stay there. Well, there's a hierarchy of needs. If the body's hungry, you're going to keep waking up. Mm. So when someone says, oh yeah, but ice cream has sugar in it. It also has protein and fat. I'm not asking you to eat junk stuff. I'm asking you to eat the stuff that's made with real food, real ingredients. Mm. If it's a real ingredient, with, with the exception of a performance enhancing drug or an illicit street drug, I say eat whatever you want. But what I try to educate my clients on is how do you combine foods? If I want to have a, a plate of spaghetti, do a little bit of the white noodles if you don't want to do the wheat, but then just overload the meat sauce with sauteed vegetables and, and lean meat. It's going to bring down the sugar content of that quote unquote bad for you white you know, mm. spaghetti. I think though, like you get into a place though, where like that, that Thailand camp, I couldn't eat enough. That's the, that, that and right there becomes the complete irony of all of it. Yeah. Like I was just like, I'd, I'd get up in the morning and I'd be, I'd, it was like hard in the morning to yes. eat there. Like I, I'm normally a real big breakfast person, mm-hmm. but we'd, I'd basically, I was so tired that I was getting up right before training sure. and I was trying to eat before training. And then like, even now, like when I do the morning sessions now, I get up and I have honey on toast mm-hmm. that for whatever reason, that it feels works. good for yep. me to train. Yep. And then I come home and then I have like a meal Absolutely. after, but like I was, I, I couldn't really eat that much before then I'd go and train and then I was starving yeah. and then we'd go and like just pig out on food and then I was like oh man like I'm gonna you know, like I'm gonna feel that sure but I was just still hungry and, and then I'd go back and I'd train again yep. and then I'd eat again and I was just hungry all the time like we had a, a little gas station sort of 7-eleven thing across the road it was just laps bro Tearing back and up. forth yep. back and ice cream every night yeah. like I just couldn't get enough of food yep. but it was because the output Mm-hmm. of you know calories in versus calories out it's like you know yeah you want to eat some salad and some carrots and look like you're eating healthy exactly, foods yep. but it's like if you burn say for example 6,000 calories Absolutely. in a day to say calorie neutral you've mm-hmm. got to eat 6,000 calories and it's like does it matter where that comes from as much it does but like you said it people get intimidated by the volume of food mm. and that's one of the things I do like about the new heart rate monitors because it does give you and it, it's all based on you know, a logarithms that they program in based on height, weight, gender, and all that. But you're exactly right. Let's say there is a margin of error of 10 or 12%. If it says you burnt 6,000 calories, caloric deficiency becomes one of the biggest challenges. Mm. Because if you take a bag of, you know, back when you were in the States, you know, they had those pre bag salads. Yep. If you ate that entire bag, it's 75 calories. Yeah. But if you're talking a bag that's, that's a lot 16 of food, ounce, yeah. yeah, the volume is there. When you're eating but healthy, there's no density, there's no, density, there's yep. no caloric density. So when you're eating fruits, vegetables, and lean protein, which is anyone who's heard me on my podcast or any other writing that I do, that's all, that's nutrition. It's the perimeter of your grocery store. That's that's how hard nutrition is. The challenge is, is exactly that dichotomy. It starts out like, wow, I feel great. Then all of a sudden it's like, man, I just can't get enough food. Well, I think so, that's the reason that like you hear vegan yep. people that are vegan, they'll be like, man, it's just the best diet for losing weight. Yep. And I'm like, yeah, it's because you're eating like, you, you look like you're eating a lot of food and you're like hoeing mm-hmm. down all this salad. There's nothing in that. No. So like you're losing weight because you're calorie you're at a calorie deficit. But at a calorie deficit, what are you eating? You're cannibalizing muscle tissue. Yeah. So yeah, they're getting smaller. But when you're especially for someone like yourself, where power is everything and size, and you don't need to be, you know, um, meek. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, you're sitting here trying to beef up. Goes back to what I said earlier about catabolic versus anabolic. Mm. 
And you bring up two things I want to make sure that the audience understands. <clears throat> Excuse me. And yeah, because I'm not an expert on this. This is no, all just it's, complete. No, it's cool. Yeah. <laughs> and I like the fact that you've saturated yourself in this new sport and it is intense and it is the margin of error could get your ass killed. You know what I mean? Or be in a world of hurt. When we said earlier, the only two things that satisfies appetites, protein and fat. Well, that's what everybody's phobic of. Yeah, exactly. So when they understand that if it's real food, your body's going to love it. If you understand it's the only thing that satisfies appetite, you'll embrace it. Then when you look at caloric deficiency, you're like, you got to do a lot more than what you think you're doing. Mm. Hence my comment on the CBS special about did you do your ice cream? Yeah. Because I'm looking at, wow, we burnt 8,000, 9,000 calories today. Then... That's a lot of food. Like That's a hell of a that, lot of food. You know, un- unless you're going to McDonald's and getting like a double quarter pounder and, and a gallon of Coke right. sort of thing. But, that but like if you're eating you real said, food, you know what I mean? But that was your question. Does it does it matter where the food comes from? Certainly it does. Well, yeah, yeah. But I think that there's the, very obvious. Yeah. There's very obvious places where you're like, don't eat 6,000 calories of Domino's. Yes. But if you're eating like honey sandwiches and a piece of homemade chocolate cake yeah. and you know what I mean? Well, then there's I'll a, put like, this in perspective to what you're saying. Remember how I said if you, when someone says the scale's up three pounds, I did the math backwards and I, hold me, don't hold me if I'm exactly, because I'm trying to go off memory here. If you, if you were up three pounds and that was roughly 10,000 calories, I think that was 16 or 18 Big Macs. Mm. Going to your example of, okay, it's junk food. Mm. That's 16, a that's a shitload of Big Macs. I don't care yeah. how much of a junk food fanatic you are. That's a lot. Yeah. But that I wanted to put it in perspective when people understand that's what a, an athlete, a dunge would have to eat when mm. he's burning 8,000 calories a day, which is very easy to do. These watches are starting to bring more credibility to my numbers in the past. Yeah. Because okay. you got to remember, I've been in this since my first motorcycle was in 78. I became a professional coach in 87. We, we just had heart rate monitors where we had to extrapolate the information, put it in Excel and, and do yeah, a bunch of crunching. So you, you, the algorithms weren't right. built into the we watches. We had to do those, yeah, which okay. made us probably a little better and as a physiologist. You, but it makes you look hokey at the same time. Exactly. Right? Yeah, but yeah. now these watches will show you that. Yeah. So my ideas that I tried to convey, like we said earlier, that fell out of flavor. You know, one of the biggest challenges we run into is I'll take a, I'll take a young athlete and I'll develop them. And they'll get to where they're making six figures, seven figures. They've got a four-year deal. They're tired of hearing my voice. They've mm. been listening to me for five years. They enjoyed what it got them, but now they're too cool for school. Yeah, It's not the first time it's happened. I could give you literally a dozen won't illustrations. It, it won't be that. And it doesn't hurt me because I know what I taught them. Hopefully, they'll come back to, as you said earlier, yeah. and it'll increase the longevity of their career. And I, I can't name names, but there are some athletes that have come back around that they're not allowed to let their teams know because they've got other trainers. And... I like that because yeah. it's not about the money. It's about they want longevity in their career. And when they were doing it, they felt great, got great results, got too cool for school and realized, as you said earlier, start starting to escape them and yeah. they want to get that pulled back. But when we go back to the idea of lots of food, when you look, and this is the thing that I love as a physiologist, it's easy to find areas of validate to me, Rob, that I'm calorically deficient. It's very easy to do. Yeah. It's, it validate to me that I'm chronically dehydrated. It's easy to do. The difference is once I validate it, it's the burden and the responsibility yeah, is on the athlete. You gonna, yeah, Because exactly. I, as you said earlier, I'm not with you 24 seven. I can't feed you. Mm. Um, I do have some athletes that are fortunate enough. They have people that do cook for them and stuff. The biggest challenge is then comes into the responsibilities of travel burdens of getting there. And it goes back full circle to our conversation. I don't manage the airlines. Yeah. I can only give the athletes some suggestions to do, hey, if then. And then it comes to them to the extra effort. Are you going to pack a, Are you going to pack your lunch? Do you know your schedule? I love what you just said. If I've already run them ragged because I'm making the program about me and now they're mentally spent and then they get a red eye or a cancellation and they're freaking pissed. Are they going to make a smart food decision? Mm. No, they have low blood sugar. They're grabbing for convenience. They're human. Yeah. This is that glass house syndrome I'm talking about. Yeah, it'd be easy if we all lived in a completely controlled vacuum. Amen. But it's not reality. And that's, like we said earlier, I'm always going to build a program that's based on health, wellness, Mm. and then performance. Yeah. And integrating and all of that is going to be a system and a process that's been validated. I've got over 150 amateur national championships. I've got four number one AMA pro titles. It's not about me. I just guided their efforts. I got them to where they could go the season. They mm. got to be in it to win it, you know? And it doesn't make me the most popular. And then as we said earlier, all it takes is a couple man friends that say, oh, I cannot believe you're yeah. doing it that way. Why are you trusting that? You know, and it that's where I, 
I get a little frustrated with it. I'm not going to lie. I mean, this will be the first time I've gone public on it and said that. It's frustrating as hell, you know, because I invest in them. If, if you allow me to work, let's bring up Wes. I invested in Wes's program. I want Wes to succeed. I was going to mention that. So with that was like my first real interaction with your training in terms of like watching somebody do it, right? Mm. So my one of my best friends, Wes Williams, he did the BC bike race, which is r- crazy. Brutal. Seven days through British Columbia. And it's like, how many kilometers was it? So like, it changed a little bit each day. I don't remember it, what the grand total that was. In the on the saddle for like eight hours a day for like per a day. week. Per day. And and he had no real mountain bike mm-hmm. background before this. And they all come together, like Brett Stallo, David Bulmer. Yep. They all come together. And you did Wes's program. And I was living with Wes pretty much full time at, okay. at the time. So like we would we would be working together a lot in and out of hotels a lot. And then I was staying at his uh, San Clemente house a lot. So I was like seeing this. And if I wasn't with him firsthand, yeah. I was in constant phone calls for the work that we were doing. Yeah. And he'd be, oh, I'm on a two hour bike ride today. And what you were talking about before is that zone one, zone two, zone three, zone four. That was the first time I w- was uh ever like put on to that sort of thing and he was explaining it to me and at the start he was doing these like two hour bike rides yeah where he wasn't allowed to get his heart rate of like 140 or right. something from memory right and uh and i was just like damn this is gnarly and he stuck to it to a t and i'll give that to him and he got in phenomenal shape was it six months that he trained for? that's all we had was six months and yeah. he was coming up you guys were doing a bunch of road trips yeah and yep. lots and lots of work. he my point being is he didn't come in in the best of shape no no Let's no not at that, all no you know? and, and he didn't have that much experience or uh, time as a mountain biker yeah and he got on that program that you did and it was all about that heart rate based zone training right and then at the start he was doing these two hour rides under 140 beats per minute and then he was like i just gotta go and just gotta go get on it and then it slowly ramped up so and dude he got ripped like you could physically see how fit he was and then when he went and did the right like he was in phenomenal shape in six months of training so that was for me like when you know you say like people can say it's like chokey and whatever like i I legitimately watched one of my best friends physically transform through this really methodical um way of training and and you put that program together for him so i it, it you know sometimes it's like i think it's important to know that a guy like yourself can do that for an average person it's not just these elite dudes where it's like that jeremy martin kind of guy where like he'll fucking run to the moon and back if That's you tell right. him to yeah. it's like it's it's not always those guys that you can get results it's not just those guys you get results from like it can be a normal person well and, and let's face it i mean that those elite athletes represent less than one half of one percent yeah you know what i mean uh, going back to what you're saying with Wes, what people need to understand is the heart rate zones that we were having him train with were based off of a time trial that we did that then gave us his most up-to-date max heart rate. One of the big misunderstandings that are out there is as you become physically fitter, your max heart rate should actually go down, not go up. Mm. Because if you think about the heart like a bicep muscle, as it gets stronger, it pumps more millimoles of blood per, per beat. pump. So yeah. it, can get, it can handle those higher thresholds at a lower. We evaluate, my big buzzword is cross-validate. Please don't just take something I say. If you're, if we take a max, I'm sorry, if we take a time trial and we look at his max heart rate, we bounce it against the average heart rate. If it's more than 10 to 12 beats, one of those numbers are inaccurate. Mm. When we look at his time trial, did he get faster the second half? We'll use a 10 mile time trial as an example. Was the second half, i.e. five miles faster than the first five? Then we look at muscular endurance, lactate threshold, all of that. We then use that to build a framework. So when we say a two hour bike ride, we're not using same ambiguous 220 minus your age plus or minus your resting heart rate. It's his definitive. Mm. So like, for example, we have our athletes take their resting heart rate every day. We historically so do, you do, do that. The, sorry, do you do the max heart rate in their sport going yes. as hard as, or just in general? Like no, you just great get, question. When, let's I take motocross. That. Yeah, it's a great question. We do max heart rate on every modality that you're going to do. Okay. So we'll download in a race, download the heart rate data, because obviously in a race, you'll push harder than you will in training. And we extrapolate that number and that's your max. And we use that for four weeks. There's the key. We'll do a time trial on a set of rowers. We'll do five, we'll do five, we'll do 500 meters, five times three with one minute rest. 
extrapolate the max heart rate. Yeah, see, I don't want to do that. Yeah, it's brutal. <laughs> and then we do a 10 mile time trial. Now, if you're a runner, we'll, we'll do a three mile, four mile time trial. If you're, or you like to train for triathlons, we'll do a swim and a, you know, mm. but the idea is. So it's not just this one umbrella term of that's max exactly heart rate. it. And that okay. is one of the biggest mistakes people will make because they'll go and they'll do a VO max test in a clinical setting, which by yeah. the way, that's a total waste of money. And I'll explain why in a second. But the idea here is if your max heart rate is on the motorcycle, you're using more muscles pushing and pulling the bike than you ever will swimming. Yeah, yeah. And if you're running, you're using more muscle than you will on a bike. So you can see the mistakes that people make. They'll use one number. You're engaging more. That's right. Or less. But this is where people go, blah, 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 blah. It's too complicated. Yeah. All right. That's fine. My athletes will gap you because they're training smarter, not harder. And again, I know it sounds like a textbook cliche, but if you're not going to understand the numbers, then don't use the numbers. We're not going to be able to help Mm. you. And then I get into a lot of arguments. Well, heat and humidity influences heart rate. Well, no shit, Sherlock. The idea here is if you remember, we were talking about those verticals, the temperature verticals. Hello, come back full circle. If I know how your body responded in that temperature at that intensity for that duration, and I know what your sweat rate is, we can pretty much, like we do a lot, we, yeah. we used to work with Charlie Mullins and we set all our GNCC races up differently. One race, we may go easy for two hours and then light it up for three. We may go really hard the first and then hit cruise control for two. Change it. Caleb Russell's doing a great job with it right now. The idea here is you've got to train the energy systems to the specificity of your race and then you need to be able to race with a strategy. My guys at Loretta's, if we get the whole shot, that's great. We know how to maintain the the, the main line and hold the lead. Mm. But their laps better be faster the second half than they are the first. That doesn't make me popular with most riding coaches. They're like, you go for broke and then you hang on. Well, that's that dreaded late moto fatigue. The body, you know, you see it at a 5K road race. Guys go out like a bat out of heck, blow up, and mm. they just gradually come back versus the guy that gets progressively faster or the female that gets faster every mile. And it's just like, again, it's so important to like stress to people, like you have to know what your body does and doesn't do well. That's a quantified data. And like, cause like with me, so me and my brother, like we both mountain bike. I stopped basically when I started training cause I just started to get a bit scared of getting hurt. Yeah. But me and Maddie go out and we do a ride and Maddie's legs don't blow up mm. at all. I have to ride through the first seven kilometers of any ride I do with like fucking balloon legs, yep. man. Like just, they feel like lead balloons. Sure. And there's for, I don't know, like my legs have, it's like a different lap, lactic capacity, or maybe I need to go back and do that low, long yep. to like, you know, set up that, that kind of, um, you know, that lactic endurance, like yep. you were saying, but it's like, everyone's different. It is. And, and it's like, you just can't expect that, you know, some people, one person is going to be the same as the no, other you're person. right. But I, everyone does. Yeah. Everyone does expect the same. Well, shit especially out if of you train in a group, because mm. it's just like monkey see, monkey do. Mm. You know, Lance Armstrong does not produce a great amount of lactic acid. I was on the junior development team for triathlons, and I got to test at the Olympic Training Center. And as part of that, we got to see some data from Olympian swimmers, and Lance was there as a cyclist and all that. He just doesn't produce lactic acid. Just a freak. And he also has the aerobic uptake of a quarter horse. Yeah. You put those two things together with peds. You wonder why you won the tour seven times? Man, that like we're going to go off topic a bit there, but like I I have like my own thoughts on that whole thing like it, in a sport like is he is he cheating if like everyone is doing no, it? No, he's not. You know, and no. I I mean we like they made a martyr out of him and I I it sucks to me because it's like the UCI or whoever's in control of the Tour de France. Right. Is that who does the Tour de France? Yeah, or is it different? There's like four groups in yeah, there. Yeah, okay. But, but it's like to me, I'm like on I'm, I'm looking at my with my skeptical hippo eyes and I'm like, all right, so you're making this race yeah. the hardest race in the world. And every year it gets harder. Yep. Every year the bikes let these guys get a little bit you know, go a little bit faster. Like everything you're pushing, you're pushing, you're pushing. Yep. But it's like the body is the body, right? That's right. Like we can't just evolve a human to ride better. So it's yeah. like these guys are like, look, yeah, they're cheating, but it's like this shit's got so hard yeah. and it's on such a razor edge now that it's like, how do you, like these organizations like making money off, like making it essentially harder. That's and right. it's like a freak show where it like is. we're watching the freak show. Like how the fuck are these dudes going to finish this race? But then the athletes aren't allowed to do anything to like keep up. But then you play that out and it's like dudes were dying from EPO like right. because of the way that it thickens your blood and your heart sure. just stops in your sleep. So it's like, damn, it's, man, it's such a weird, that whole Lance Armstrong conversation 
to me is such a crazy conversation because it's like how far back would you have to go on the tour de france to find a dude that's never done any drugs well you you wouldn't i don't I mean, think you, if could. you could no i mean if if you do any due diligence on you know you know on youtube and google and i know that's not the gospel but there's some pretty good you know documentaries that are out there well you're icarus find, was a crazy one icarus, for that. icarus opened a lot of people's eyes to the you know how dirty it is and uh you know answering your question going back to the tour i mean you go back to literally you know almost the beginning i mean they were snorting coke and they were doing cigarettes i mean it's a stimulant i mean yeah whether you like it or you don't i mean there's pictures of guys smoking cigarette in the tour it's not like i'm saying something that's not documented yeah yeah um, the, the last thing was total bullshit, you know, because once they got Hamilton pinned down, he was either going to go be in jail with Bubba or he was going to narc on the whole postal program. He started quacking like a duck. And then, cause these dudes aren't criminals. They're cyclists. They're like, cyclists, but you know, don't, you don't want to go to jail when you're a cyclist, especially when you're small as Tyler Hamilton, yeah. you know, and, and to make a long story short, you know, they, they were on a rampage to get him, and I'm with you, you know, I, I yeah, he, he made some really he destroyed a lot of careers. I get it. I'm not minimizing it. I, I know he's ruined a lot of people's careers. The part that really rubs me the wrong way is, if you know, he's really good friends with George Hincapie, but yet Hincapie testified. Everybody on the team testified. They got a three-month penalty that just happened to correlate with the off-season. So there's yeah. no loss of revenue there. They were not required to give any of their salary back, none of their bonuses back. And Lance had to give all that back, relinquish all of his titles, and then is not allowed to do triathlons, running races, or anything that's BS. I think it's terrible. Total I think BS. What too, like for me, when I was watching the whole thing go down, I'm just sitting there thinking like, this is their chance mm-hmm. to step up as like the UCI, the Federate and just say, look, we have a problem in yep. this sport as a whole. Yep. I just think to pin it on one dude, it's like, man, they had a real chance there to clean up the sport overall yep. and say, look, we are asking a lot of these athletes and look, we, maybe we're at fault for turning these guys to this. Maybe the money, it's all the it pressure, money. It's all, you know, money. all of this stuff is like really there's there's cause and effect here. Yep. And maybe we as the UCI and the promoter, maybe we've pushed too hard. And instead of trying to topple one of the most inspirational and notable athletes of this century. Yeah. Let's just fuck him for everything. Sure. And well, I just think that was such an irresponsible move. And I think it hurt the sport. I stopped watching the Tour de France. I just was like, you know what? Fuck all this. You're right. I could see through it. Sure. It's, it, it was just a full like dog and pony show. Absolutely. And it's like, let's just pin all this dirt on this one. That, an entire dirty sport got pinned on the back of one of the greatest sportsmen the world has ever known. Absolutely. And, and I've met Lance. And I've, Great guy. I've spoke to him. He's he was super a guy. Weird dude, but a nice guy. Yep. But like, you just look and you're like, man, this really like we lost something yeah. with with this guy, and that that was their chance to come. And it's like, it's like bodybuilding. Mm-hmm. We all know they're doing steroids. Right. The sport, it's it's a facilitated sort of thing. Right. But it's like the sport isn't throwing anyone under the bus because they, you know, there's yeah. a bit of respect there that's going on that that knows that this is the show now. But I think that cycling had a chance to go like, look, let's not pin this on this one guy. Let's use this one guy to help clean up the sport. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. And oh, it really disappointed me. Like, and now well, I don't give a fuck about cycling now. And, and no, I don't think 99% a of America of does anymore. Yeah. And and I agree with you. You you mentioned the, the movie Icarus. I mean, if anyone hasn't listened or watched it, my gosh, you have it's on to Netflix. see it. It's insane. Yeah. It's absolutely it's worth it. It's that, worth the read. That or the mo- listen. That, that documentary, like Brian Fogel, that's his name. Yes, right? Brian. Yeah. So, not to spoil it for anyone, but he kind of goes in with like this one thing. He's trying to uncover Total this accidental, one thing. Man. Boom! Just blows the complete like blows open an entire national scandal. Like you could that couldn't you couldn't write that as a movie amen you exactly it right. it was unbelievable yes. you so had to you almost go back and watch it again like that dude, section like they had again. the little door where they go out the back like it was that well orchestrated oh my and god and the idea that you kept the enemy close because the you know the supposed testers were actually you know informants and the thing that and i liked what you said the idea that lance got carried it all for everybody in one sport and then you look at icarus I don't know how many sports are in the Olympics anymore these days. It's the entire Russian program. That's my point. You know, it's not just one sport that's carrying this. Now, Icarus pretty much surmises, let's just say for conversation's sake, there's 25 sports in the Olympics. Yeah. They're all tainted. Yeah. They're all tainted. And people ask me all the time, are we ever going to win the sport, the, the battle on drugs? No. USADA and all those guys, as we've seen, 
they're as crooked as the athletes and the teams. Stop. Yeah. Stop with it. Stop with the games. Stop with the charades. There are performance enhancing drugs. I mean, my God, we found it in curling in the Olympics this year. <laughs> I mean, bizarre. come on now. So, but to, but to, to that, right? Maybe the dude just wants to feel good in his day to day life. Was he? I don't know who he was, but like, let's say he's a thirty six year old dude. Body doesn't really produce testosterone right. anymore. Like, why? Just because I'm an Olympic athlete, do I have to wake up feeling yeah. like a thirty six year old? But it's when a there's joke. technology. But it's all a joke, though, mm. because if you understand the abuse of the TUE system, it, and I'll I'll be very quick in this example, for for you to get a TUE. All you've got What's to do, a I'm sorry, a therapeutic use exemption. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. okay. Yep, yep. So if you've got a therapeutic use exemption, the only, it's just, this is how hard it is to get it. Go to your doctor, like you were teasing, having a problem in the bedroom, need some testosterone. Doesn't matter that I'm number one tennis player, soccer player in mm. the world. I have a problem. Doctor writes a script, wink, wink. You go, you go to your federation, you go, look, I have a doctor that says I need this. Well, this is a performance hand drug. I don't care. My Doesn't doctor matter. says I yeah. need it. Okay. There's a couple of tennis pros right now that amongst the two of them have over 30 TUEs. Yeah, that's crazy. And I always say it this way, and yes, I'm a physiologist and I get a little bit anal about it. If you have that many TUEs, are you even healthy enough to perform? Yeah, should you be playing sport or should you be in bed trying right. to fix this shit? So look at the Tour de France as we talked about, the use of salbuterol and all of that. If you understand that he was 10 times over the limit and was having to take the salbuterol, mm. usually somebody that's in that case is damn near dead because they can't breathe. They're trying to get a, bran- a brachiodilator into their lungs. You're taking 10 puffs of this? And it, you're telling me that, you see the, you see where yeah, that makes sense yeah. to me? It's Like resigned. you're supposed to be an elite athlete, yet you need the, a dose of something that would like keep a normal person from dying. Alive, yeah. exactly. And then you want to turn around and yeah, say, well, it doesn't well, add up. It doesn't add yeah. up. So then you see the farce of a TUE because now you've got a governing body that says, oh, wink, wink, you got it from your doctor? Hey, we're going to watch it hit 130 mile an hour serve. And the last person that did that as a female was doing 98. Yeah. I can sensationalize it and sell it on TV and sell sponsorship and get viewership. That's Goes back to that's what you what, said. That's the thing that really pissed me off with the Lance thing is that it's like, where, like you're telling me, and, and I mean, I know this for like as, as much as you could say without knowing something's a fact, right? me saying I know it's a fact yep. they know he was doping the whole time yeah. the whole time that they're making him the poster boy yeah. and they're selling millions and millions of dollars of sponsorship multi-million dollar TV deals they know he's doping Yep, they know it yep. all of that that, that is going on behind closed doors and the people cashing the checks off the back of Lance Armstrong. Right. They're as guilty as everyone else. They know what the fuck is happening. They do. I know what's happening. Yep. I'm just a little kid in Australia at the time. You, yep. know, you know what I mean? So it's like it's so it's fine for them to be under their federation flag yep. and behind their corporation and they can make these calls, make these deals, make that money, bring on all of these people. America's hero. He's just beat cancer. All this make what they did out of him and then as soon as it looks bad for them they yep. just chop the legs out from underneath him now he can't do this he That's can't right. do that it's bullshit they should in in my personal opinion i think they should have just gone come together done crazy damage control and said look we've got a problem maybe we've pushed things too hard we need to now work with everybody because it's not just lance it's a lot of people and the thing too, like you ask anyone that knows, yeah. they're like, if you take all the drugs off everybody, Lance still wins. Absolutely. He's a freak. Absolutely. He's a freak of nature. But take your thread of thought a little bit further. You know, the problem that I have with it is you're going through this whole process. We've already seen that the, the federations and the bodies, as we saw in Icarus, they're already tainted. They're sitting up there tooting their horn like they're there to make the sport cleaner. We've already seen that there's payoffs and there's all the BS yeah. behind the scenes. Get rid of all of it. Yeah. The thing that really bugs me the most is if you're going to bust everybody on the postal team and you're going to distribute, let's call it penalties for a generic term, then just give Lance the same penalty and be done with it. Yeah. Give him the three month viol, you know, but if you didn't take King Cappies and you didn't take everybody else's on the team, but you took his salary, his bonuses and his championships, that to me is where I see there's a little bit of a disjoint there. Mm. If you're going to in- instill some penalties and make it across the board, great. That's okay. We all got our hands slapped, but it was the same. Mm. Why does he, ha- and I understand he was the guy, he was a patriarch, you know, matriarch of the team. I get all that. But you, like you said, you can't yeah. let one guy. And at the end of the day, when you see how the, the federations in themselves, you know, these testing organizations, they're a debacle all in themselves. The fact that the, the federations, I don't care if it's tennis or whatever, they're all in cahoots with one another. Mm. Stop. 
run what you brung. Everybody's doing it. You're never, and I know that sounds horrible because I have two young boys. I have a young daughter mm. now. And the idea, do I want them to do it? No, but if my son came to me and said, Dad, I want to be a professional football player, dude, you're going to have to take steroids. You have to run a 4-2, whatever the number is, to be yeah. faster than snot. I understand that. But stop being naive. We're yeah, and acting like it doesn't happen. That's exactly right. My son wants to go into cycling. Dude, you're going to understand that you're going to hit a point that you're going to have to take HGH, testosterone, and APL. Yeah. The thing is, though, like with, with sport, right, and it's like we just said before, like people just aren't the same. So it's like you're trying to make this thing fair. That's right. But it's like no one starts from... It's like a 100-meter race. The simplest way to explain it would be you've got eight dudes, it's a 100-meter race, and you're lining them all up on the same start line. Well, Usain Bolt and me aren't on the same start line. No. You know, like... No. I'd need to be at the 30-meter line. Like, I'd need to... I He could run 100 meters in how long it could take me to run 40 meters. That's right. So it's like... The start line isn't the same. So right. it's like this this notion of fair is just out the window yeah. altogether. And you look at like Tyrone Woodley in the UFC. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with him. No. He's a um, middle wel- welterweight champ, 170 pounds. Dude is a fucking gorilla. Mm-hmm. Like natural. Yeah. Like he's passed every drug test ever, yep. right? But then you go to like, say, a dude like Damian Meyer, Brazilian dude, same weight class, looks like a dad. Yeah what's the like let's get their blood break mm-hmm. down the hormones break down like there's a whole concoction of shit going on in tyrone woodley right that is not even present mm-hmm. in damian meyer yep. but you want them to get in the cage and and fight in the same weight class for the same like it's not the same and you look at say you've got a nutritionist that is now you got one guy that's got a nutritionist one guy that doesn't well, that's performance enhancing. Absolutely. You've got a guy now that's cooking all of your meals, that's measuring your blood sugar three times a day. Yep. You're getting the exact amount of hydration that you need to be. And this guy's just got his missus that doesn't really know how to cook that. Sure. Good. So it's like this whole notion of fair. Yeah. I, I think that probably the way to do it, and again, just being an idiot that doesn't know that much, like I think why don't you just have these like hormone markers in mm-hmm. your body that you just have to be within a threshold. Well, they they find they have found ways to screw with those as well, you know, because there's ways mm. that you can you can pull numbers down. You see that right now with the testosterone, cross gender, and all that. If it uh, produces too much, they've got little games. You're never going to beat the science of it. Yeah, that's why I'm saying, you know, like I get asked all the time, will we ever be able to keep up with the performance enhancing drugs? No. And the answer is no. You never will. It's but a it's game. the same as illicit drugs. That's exactly right. The thing is, people, it's it's what you're dealing with is not drugs. You're dealing with human nature. Right. And the, but the problem that I run into is people want to be somewhat, not even somewhat, just outright naive. Mm. You know, people say, oh, Rob, you're just jaded, you know. No, I, I, I want to see people f- race, compete competitively, um, legitimately. But when I see somebody that, in, in my world of physiology, we look at, like, I'll get, I'll get calls from around the world, interviews in magazines, stuff like that. Do you think X, Y, Z person is cheating? Yes. Yeah. Why do you think so? Because of the t- what we term marginal gains. When you yeah. see somebody as a junior and they're mid-pack to backpack, and then all of a sudden they quote unquote get into a new program, I'm taking cycling as an example, and all of a sudden they catapult to the front of the biggest yeah. and most difficult race with no pedigree that precedes it, I have a hard time with that. Mm. You know what I mean? Now, does that mean that you can't work, you make that gap up with some sweat equity? I understand your point. But let's let's get, let's go right to the very top. You use the hundred meters as an example. You've got eight people, men or women, that are sitting on the gate, and somebody, i.e., and I, uh, Usain Bolt, is two point three steps ahead of somebody else, and the person that got second, third, fourth, and fifth have all tested positive for drugs. The marginal gains do, that doesn't add up. Mm. If you look at them as a junior, it doesn't add up. That doesn't really apply to you saying, but for each, because people come to me at different sports. Well, our yeah, sport's yeah. clear. I, I could take every single sport, give me just a little bit of time with some research in our team, and I can show you that you the junior, out, yeah. the marginal gains don't make sense. So when somebody is working under the toolage of another coach and has had this baby fat for three years, goes to a new program and miraculously becomes lean and goes from fourth, fifth, sixth place guy to just putting a Waxing 15 second everybody. gap on everybody, it doesn't add up. Mm. And it's not that I'm jaded, not because they're not working with me. You ask me a question, I'm giving you the answer. Look mm. at the numbers. That doesn't make sense. And if, like you said, people who aren't athletes, they go, oh, you're just in a bad mood. No, you ask me a question. I'm basing it on zeros and ones. Brings me back to the Sheldon Cooper. Mm. What are you looking at? 
if the if, if the marginal gains are not there, and you can do some research behind the scenes. There's a guy that I really like, Nate Larondi, who's an ex-professional triathlete, and he's a huge number cruncher guy. He goes out and he looks at times, and you know whether it's a time trial in the Tour de France or whatever, even an Ironman, and he's like looking at when the drug tests and the bus came around and mm. how the times got faster to a certain point. Then people's names showed up on lists. Those people miraculously just fell off the fitness bandwagon. What happened? Mm. I thought the training program was pure. Now all of a sudden your name comes up on a short list. Then your performance just declines over, mm. overnight. Look at the numbers. They don't yeah, lie. Yeah. Marginal improvement going in and declines on the backside, correlating it against testing. I could show you 50 years of, of history with it yeah and and that's the thing with like a thing like the tour de france you've got the lap times yeah you you know you know when drug busts happen like i'm sure that the couple of years after lance got busted yeah. the tour times went down overall absolutely well yeah the average you know, speed of the tour is like I don't, I don't know the exact number it's like five six miles an hour faster in just the last decade mm. well you know the thing that always cracks me but up, that's the thing is like human like how much better can a human get but that's the point marginal you know? gains of improvement yeah. it doesn't add up there's only, like we're not evolving that's right. In the space of six years, human <laughs> physiology doesn't evolve. That's right. Like we are who we are That's right, right now. Well, and you look at like, I'm going to use only because it's public record. I'm not you know, yeah. going on, out on a limb here, but you look at uh, Floyd Landis. The way that he got popped was the stage before he won, which by the way, that was a stage that he failed the drug test. The stage before, he almost didn't make the time cut off. Mm. So let's just call it stage 14. Stage 15 is up out Duez, and he pummels the field drops everybody how do you go from not making almost making the cut on the previous stage on the one of the most difficult stages i mean that's how stupid some people are yeah you don't go what drugs would that would they be doing to like get that kind of performance the, the big mat the the big trio for them are going to be epo yeah testosterone hgh okay. the hgh is so going to help with recovery of that. it's that the hgh is going to help with recovery the testosterone obviously is a booster with recovery as well, and then the EPO is just a blood enhancer. Mm. Then they so get basically, it, the EPO lets more oxygen go to your red blood cells, which actually then delivers in, it to it muscles. increases the amount of blood, the volume yeah, okay. of red blood cells. Okay, so in, in motors, so world, that's why your blood gets thicker, right? And yep. that's why that Danish team had you know four or five guys die over the course of a week in the tour because they got over. Fuck, that's heavy. Eh? They got over just they got over Dude's served, dying. Yeah, from oh, ugh, yeah. that's creepy. I mean, and not to be disgusting, but you think about it, you know, your capillary beds, you know the. The capillaries carry the blood out. The veins bring the unoxygenated blood back. It's like all of a sudden you hook that up to a fire hose and hit go. Yeah. Ugh. Take a garden hose and put it up to a fire. That's what happens to their insides of their veins. They just literally blow up. And so they die of heart attack. So the thing that's so disgusting about it is, you know, when you look at that, people died. People still kept taking it. Mm. And that's the crazy thing about the the sport is like, even though you know the risks, even though you yeah. watch the people die, they're still going to do it. Yeah. There's all of it's these money. things. Money. Yeah. Money and prestige. And yeah, I, I was going to say, it's probably more prestige mm -hmm. to these guys. And that, everyone else is doing it. Mm. So it's easy to, to, to justify it. It's easy. And I hate to say this because you know how it is. You've been around certain sects of athletes. It, it's very close knit. Mm. If you've got five of the 10 guys doing it, the sixth guy can get it pretty quickly because they're going to network with one another and it doesn't take a lot of effort and to get it. And you're pretty insulated, man. Like, I mean, I've said some shit on this podcast mm -hmm. that just like isn't common knowledge. Right. And yeah. I've thought after, I'm like, ah, fuck. Yeah. I probably shouldn't have said that because there is like this little unspoken thing. And it's, it's funny, like I'll get criticized on YouTube comments or whatever, like, oh, name dropping this and that. It's like, no, nah, man, I'm just saying shit that like, people I haven't really said before this right. was like secret squirrel stuff right. and I'm you're trying to in, share well yeah. I'm not even like you forget the cameras are on right like you just it's two dudes yep. talking yeah you know what I mean and it's like and you start saying the things that you uh, don't really say all the time but, but you, know? you bring up a good point you know the keyboard squirrels that are out there those are the guys that want to say what you're saying is not accurate. They want to invalidate what you have to say. Mm. And when you can back it up with, you've seen it with your own eyeballs and experienced it, they're the ones that don't want to believe it. They want to be naive and then they want to start throwing the, the, ugly, you know, mm. the ugly and the negative comments. Bring it. I'm not name dropping. You ask me a question, I'm going to give it to yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. You've seen it, you, you know. And if you have a problem with that, well, that's that's just you being jealous and, and just being a squirrel on the keyboard. It's a weird world out there with it that is, stuff. It is, because it, I always say it, like on my last podcast I did, somebody asked me about why people move on from my program. And David, my co-host, said, 
oh, people, when you ask these questions, you got to be ready for the answer. Don't, if you don't want to know it, don't ask it. Yeah. And I know where the question was going, you know, and, and I wasn't going to go down that road. Um, I, I gave my opinion and I skirted around, not because I was trying to dodge it, because I knew what the guy was going after. Yeah. And my point in all of that is, why are people doing it? Well, because it's a small network of people and it becomes easy to do it. Yeah. You know, it's the why people are doing it and nobody and says you, it. And yeah, like, sorry, but cut you off for no, where I good. was going before was like, there is, it is a small industry. Like mm-hmm. we know all the same people. Yeah. Like, and, and that's like, you know, you're like, oh, no, you're dropping that. Like it, no, it's small, man. Mm-hmm. There's a basket of people at that upper echelon of sport everybody knows everyone and everyone knows everyone's business and yep. they're all after the same thing and it's like there is these unspoken things that everyone knows happens that they don't divulge because they're kind of on the skirts of it themselves mm-hmm. or yeah you know what i mean or you know a lot of the stuff with um like the mike's leader episode he was talking about the way he was testing and i i was i really respected sleeter for saying some of the stuff he did because like that's stuff that people don't say. That's right. They want to keep it insulated. And I think there's like, I think there's a little bit of like ego as well, where Absolutely. sometimes people that are privy to a secret mm-hmm. have an ego about the secret and they're like, well, I can't really say. Sure. And I'm, I fucking personally hate that. Yep. So, but you know, I think there's a lot of that as well. And then people will, they keep the little secret squirrel thing going mm-hmm. because they, they like the fact that they're actually. Sure privy to that little bit of information you know well knowledge is power i guess they they want to look at it that way and they think the thing that i always like to say is you think we're naive and we're not Mm. you know what i mean when somebody's out there being a keyboard squirrel you know they're just who's got the time it's like when somebody thumbs down my video your video i'm like move on dude i had a guy straight up i hope he's listening i had a guy create a fake facebook profile to to write me a message inbox me a message and told me how shit the Chad Reed podcast was unbelievable, and I'm like, get a life, dude. And I, I like, I clicked, and then I was like, you're not even a real person. Right. Like, this is a fake name. Yep. Like, you're trying to discredit something that I did. Like, my name's on this, dude. Like, exactly. You could find me and message me. Yep. And like now you're like, you they're know, spineless. It's weird. They're spineless. It's such a weird thing. Anyway, well, it's it like you say, it, whether it's jealousy or I don't know what it is, but you know, move on. It's, and like, who uh, cares if I did a shit job? It's mine. Well, but why is it shit? Because it's yeah. not their way. That's what. That's kind of like. That's what, what I don't understand. It's your show. That's what I kind of said. He's like, oh, you know, like I expect it. I expect to listen to this, and I was like, well, that's where you're going wrong. Yeah. Because like, if you have an expectation of what you think a podcast should be, just start one. It's exactly. F- it's free. Yep. It's free to do. It's free to listen to. Yep. And, and I want to see you put the amount of time and, and effort yeah. that goes into these shows. And, and then it's yours. Yeah, exactly. You can be whoever you want. It's and like, I'm sure you can get somebody that'll agree with your opinion somewhere. Yeah. No, it's, it's crazy. And it's like you say, I mean, in the bigger picture of things, if someone's going to ask a question, you know, um, there, I make ethical decisions. I've got two little boys and a, and a girl and you know, I, all I have is my reputation. So mm. I'm going to consciously walk away from things that are going to, to mar my yeah. image. Did my ju- I can't imagine being 22 years old with the opportunity to make eight, nine, 10 million. Like, I've never been put in that position. Mm. I'm not going to be judge and jury on that, but I will shake your hand and say, you know what? I just can't be a part of that. Mm. I understand why you got to go there. I can't be a part of it. Yeah. Because I couldn't look your now widow in the eyes and say, we gambled and we lost. Unfortunately, yeah. we lost him too. Yeah. Because we were, might make $8 million. Because to me, the money's not worth, money could be made and lost. I think it's more prestige than money that these guys like, can you imagine like a Tour de France dude? Like you live in that saddle. Right. Like that's it. Yep. That's your existence. Yep. And and the mental, the mental, it's not like a prison, but it's like your office is this like, so my mom drives 15 minutes to work and then she sits in her office for eight hours and then she comes home. Yep. Right. The dude that's trying to do the Tour de France is getting out of his garage or wherever he's got to go, sure. and then he sits on that bike seat, and that's his office. And, and the he's, rain, and, and his the snow, and the cold, drivers, the heat, all that. And it's just all you have is like this insulin, like your office becomes sure. like the walls of your brain, and then all of the things that all of this external feedback is like your legs burning, it's your lungs burning, it's the it's like struggling to breathe, right. and it's that mental place that you would have to go to to live in that place of discomfort like what it what you must have to justify to yourself that to make that worth it 
that's got to be a fucking weird place to spend that much time. And it's almost like there's probably times where those dudes would be like, fuck, I wish I, I wish I like death would be easier than you. I than think what you it hit takes, it on the head. I, you know? I love where you're going deep with it because I totally agree. Their office is in inside their head just these fucking walls of their brain yeah. and they've got to figure out a way to stay on that bike yeah and look at what you said when you did the boot camp when mm. you're doing two a days and they've been doing that for 12 years and years that's and years. all they know so this is i like where you went deep with this because it's easy to sit out and be judge and jury you know but let's i mean let's just be blunt you know a lot of these guys are not educated no sometimes don't even make it to high school because this it, the sport requires mm-hmm. it now you're talking about the demons you're talking about the fears the doubts you're waking up and your entire body aches and like you said sometimes you just don't want to do it and you've probably got to have crazy demons to even want to do that in the first place to even get you on that but if bike. you've been if you've quote unquote been forced doing that since you were literally seven eight years old that's all you know mm. then the fear of failure you're gonna let your parents down there's all this expect and i'm not wow 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 we're all responsible but mm. I disagree at some level when you're starting at six and seven and then your parents made a decision to pull you out of school. Now you're uneducated. Mm. You're a fast athlete. I don't care if you're a cyclist, motocross, triathlete, whatever. Where are you going to go with that? Mm. You tell about the, the fear of failure. I mean, fear of failure means I'm going back and what am I going to do? Go into the real world. I always love that term real world. Yeah. These folks are living in the real world. They're just living in the most in difficult real world. World, yeah. world. You know, if you ever watch Lance, even in his current podcast, he's very clear. He hates the cold and he hates the snow. And if you look at some of those old videos, those training videos he did with him and Johan, they're out there in the Swiss Alps and it's freaking snowing. Yeah. And my point is he's out there doing what he doesn't want to do, but that's all he, mm. I'm not gonna say it's all he knows to do because he's actually a smart guy, but you know, it doesn't matter what sport you're in, those fears, the doubts, like you say, Take EPO and I don't feel quite as fatigued. Hey, take some HGH and I recover quicker. Well, when I've been sitting on my bike, as you say, for eight, nine hours and I'm at day 13 of a brand new boot camp and I just feel like I came and brushed my teeth, I'm so tired and sore, yeah. those become a legitimate enticement. Yeah. I can feel a little bit better and put up with this. Or if you, or just knowing that like no matter how hard you work, if you don't take this shit, and the guy that's working as hard as you or less. does take it or less or not as hard that's it does take and you're going to get waxed yes it's like what like you really what choice do you have you don't at that level you don't and it's like you just can't spend that that much time and and even again like not to I'm not some special dude but like I I train basically 6 days a week yep. I I dislocated my elbow on Tuesday and I trained yesterday mm. And I shouldn't have done that. Right. I got home and I was like, "Where the fuck did you do that? Like sure. I, I literally walked straight in the door, went for my ice pack and I strapped it up to my elbow. My elbow still hurts now. Yep. And I'm going to train tomorrow. Yep. There's some weird shit that goes on in your head. Like there is this mental thing that happens when you do get into this routine and something becomes like a part of you. It's, mm-hmm. it's a weird thing to explain, but it's like I would always rag on CrossFit. Mm-hmm. I'd be like, these people are in a fucking cult. Yeah. They're so weird. They're so... Co- I'd always talk shit on CrossFit. And now I get it. Mm-hmm. Because what I do is, is a cult in, yep. a, in ways. Like, where the, a group of people that get together every single day and we just do, like, pretty weird shit that, like, doesn't sure. make sense to the average person. Right. But there is clarity in that for mm-hmm. me. There is something in that for me. Like, there's some... There's meaning in it. There's purpose. And you'll do things to your body that they don't make sense you know it's not smart for me to go back and train right like that you know i've had a problem with my foot for months and i've i've been to one physio session he said to get an x-ray and i was like no nah, i'm not gonna I'm, do, I'm not doing the x-ray yeah. thing because then you're like well now if something's wrong with it like you can block that out and i'm on this tiny 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 level of sport like but, you but know it's, but i'm it's living life. in a, but it it's is, real yeah. life you know, but you look, you then extrapolate that out mm-hmm. to like a Lance Armstrong sure. or those guys that died from the EPO. Yep. So like if I'm experiencing it in this micro scale at that tiny level that I am, imagine what a Ryan Dungey's doing. Imagine what a Lance Armstrong is doing. Imagine the headspace that those guys have to get into if they're that much ahead of where I'm at and I'm doing that shit to myself. Well, that's where it's interesting. And that's why I appreciate being with you. That's my job. Mm. You know, I'm that I'm that middle guy that says, okay, here's where you want to go. We've we've quantified it. We know it's important to you. Here's the process that's going to get us there. And I have to be the referee in the middle that says, you blew your elbow out. You took a huge hit to the you know your elbows all the way forty degrees to the side. 
I need to rationally bring you through that. What ends up happening is I call it the little chirping bird on your shoulder. Mm. Oh, if you don't do this today, you're going to get fat. Oh, or you're going to lose your fitness. You're going to lose your edge. You're going to lose whatever that criteria is. Mm. If it's a triathlete, it could be your swim skills. It could be your biomechanics, whatever. That fear base, that's why I always work with my athletes. We always work in a proactive manner. We're doing this. This is a building block towards what? Mm. Every day is a micro workout that fits a it's week. It's like that 1% better kind of thing. That's my mantra. Mm. Be 1% better every day. Could be being properly hydrated, more calories, whatever it is. This what brings the conversation full circle. If I come in and I say, look, Jace, I know you want to train and we know that we want to hit this deadline, say mm. it's an event or whatever, but going out and blowing your elbow out even worse is going to then prolong how quickly you can come back. That's where I have to come in and be the rationale in your head to go, you okay, be the bad guy. Well, I can times. either be the bad guy or I could be, you know, the, the old joke hero or zero, mm. you know, because if I can, this is what I always say. You've got to look back before we can look forward. You come back to me and you're like, Rob, I got blown out in the elbow. And I'm like, right, Jace, we've never done this before. because we've only been working together a year, but this is how we're going to handle that injury. And I get you out of it in 10 days instead of 21. Mm. The next time you get hurt, you'll have a little more confidence because yeah. you can look back at that success. But that's where I have to earn everyone's trust. Mm. Because when I say it going in, it's a concept and a theory. Until you until you endure it, then you trust the process and the system. Then the next time, you know, say that you got a virus right before your fight. Well, I'm going to give you some things to do to get out of it. And yeah, it stunk. The timing was bad. But we go out and we win the fight, even though we overcame the virus. Well, the next time you get a virus, you become less and less yeah. fearful yeah. because you've got the success. And that's why we say my program is called the blueprint of success. When I win a championship with somebody, the number one fear they have is, well, how do I keep sustaining this? It goes mm -hmm. back to what you said earlier. Well, if you know what we did to get here. We know what we can do to continue to build on it. Yeah. Your success, your continuum of improvement will never stop. But that's where you start getting the little man friends that start telling you you're doing things wrong. Are we on a one? Are we on a trajectory to go up, or do mm. we want to kind of do this? Where eventually, I'm looking for a lifetime of it. You know, is is a particular professional motocrosser going to be able to do it for 30 years? No, we're neither one of us are naive to realize that. Yeah. But the idea that after that career is over, well, let's just describe career. Was that career three years or 13 years? I mean, we've got Chad out there that has been through Ricky and James. He's 105 and, this year. Right. <laughs> I mean, it's just unbelievable. And, you know, here he is banging bars now with, you fill in the blank, if you want to call Jason the new thing or Roxanne the new, but this is the same guy that was battling with James and Ricky and, you know, goes all the way out to. It's You know what's crazy? I watched a, um, speaking on Chad. Yeah. I was watching a podcast with Mathers. And uh, he was on there, and Vullerman was on there, and Tim Ferry, and it was when they were like they were doing like Yamaha a bit of a Yamaha yeah. like re reunion kind of thing, I guess. And like you look at Vullerman now, that ain't no athlete. No. And you look at Chad, and it's like you just look. You can see the age on Vullerman, and you can see how mm -hmm. out of shape he is. Sure. And you can see not not talking shit. I understand. Like, yeah, like, it is what like it is. Villain, like this yeah. dude's still an athlete that's doing twenty lap main events yeah. at the highest level. Got ninth on the weekend. Yeah. And then there's David Vullerman, and it's like that is that's not like some special thing chad's got like that's this maintaining right. workload that yep. has just kept him in that kind of shape and it's like it's really easy to see like what the alternative is absolutely is the alternative like those two were like david villeman's peak was chad reed winning in 2004 right like that was villeman's peak yep. you know so then it's like you see that those two dudes they like, existed in the same thing but you fast forward what 14 years he's still out there and it's like that dude's out there that yep. dude's not like it's well, crazy and it's funny you say that because i get a bad rap because i'm looking at somebody like a chad chad's made money year after year after year maybe not as much as when he was even at yamaha of troy you know those were the heydays for him yeah and then obviously doing you know the first yamaha gig but when you really boil it down that's what i try to preach to these young athletes is you got to be in it to win it you got to be in it for a long period of time and you've got to have balance and fun. Mm. Now I'm not saying that we're going to be mischievous and we're going to not respect that we have a career and a job racing our dirt bikes, but that's the thing I want people to understand. And it's funny to me, I've been very fortunate. I mean, AC is an amateur germ as an, as an amateur, you know, as we were, you were saying earlier, and yet they've gone to programs where they've gotten completely roached and it's public record. I mean, mm. you know, they went to, and, I'm going to say this as respectfully as I can. You have athlete A that goes to trainer B. That trainer blows this rider up. He moves on to somebody else, and then somebody comes right back into that trainer. Mm. 
Now, I don't know if we're just sadistic by nature. I don't know if we're looking for, I, my personal opinion is we're looking for built-in excuses. Mm. Because what I find with human beings is. I think that's the the key thing is like, it's not, it's human nature that we're fighting against. It's human nature when it comes to the performance enhancing drugs thing. Right. It's perf- performance enhancing, uh, sorry, human nature when it comes to like picking a trainer sure. and like you know it's always an element of just that that human nature right. the man friend that's telling you not to Absolutely. do this Absolutely, that's human nature mm-hmm. it's just this climb that these guys are on and when you're existing not in a vacuum right there's so many things at play like it's even hard to like just you know blame one person sure. for success or failure well that's why i like to focus on the zeros and ones mm. because it's not whether you like me or you don't like me you're either getting leaner fitter and faster or you're getting sicker and you're getting slower. Mm-hmm. And it's not about me. That's why I said earlier, most programs, and I'll say, it, I'll go out on public record, most coaches want to call it, make it about them. If I tell you not to eat this and I make you do stuff that's just ridiculously stupid, but you're really, really sore, if that mentally makes you think that you're doing something, I'm always saying, is what we're doing moving us forward to what the ultimate goal is? Mm-hmm. So for example, if, if you've got type, tight hip, fle- hip flexors, excuse me, and you're out there working corners, and they get locked up, and you don't come off the bike and do foam rolling and trigger point therapy, then why are you surprised that three days later you still have tight hip flexors? But if we know, that's where I always try to be a little bit different than everybody else. I don't care what you think of me. If you hire me to do a job, and that is to build championships, first of all, I'm not a glass house guy. Mm. I'm not a hellfire and brimstone guy. I'm all about balance, and I want to- Yeah, you're just like a level person. Well, I just want to educate people. If you, if you struggle in our, in our general fitness and weight loss, when mm. somebody's been on an up and down yo-yo with weight, no one's going to explain to them. Like, for example, you know, Zone, Atkins, South Beach, all these guys, their big thing was, I'll guarantee 10 pounds off you in a week. All right. Now, they sell you a book yeah. that's a quarter of an inch yeah. thick. All right. The whole science behind that methodology is when you eat a complex carbohydrate, a fruit or a vegetable, it converts it to stored glycogen in your liver and your muscles. There's a 2.8 gram water retention mm. for the conversion of a complex carb to stored carb to stored glycogen. Well, they're not going to tell you that because they want to sell you a book. They want to sell you a meal. They want to sell you a can or a bag of something. Mm. If I can educate people that if you eat fruits and vegetables and if some source of lean meat every two hours, and if you want to get technical, stabilize blood sugar behind the scenes, you're going to lose weight like nobody's other. Mm. You want to increase your endurance. You want to increase the strength of your immune system. Eat fruits and vegetables and protein every two hours. Now, you can sit and say, oh, that's so boring. It's not. I know it's not sexy. Yeah, exactly. But it works. Yeah. And when you look at your resting heart rate and when you're up more than five beats, you go, hey, today's not a day to do any anaerobic threshold because I haven't absorbed, whether it's the last 24, 48 or 72 hours. That's not sexy. Mm. It's I don't care if you're sore. Suck it up, buttercup. Let's go. That sounds sexy and sizzling. And yeah, we're all in it. Well, wait, are you trying to be healthy? There is something to that, though. I there will is, say, as like, long as the health is in front in, of it. In a short term, and I think that that's where we've seen with some programs, like you'll just get maximum out of someone for like three years. Yep. There's a certain level. So like, I mean, to play devil's advocate, do you want a long career when a guy like Villapoto who can show up, clean house, and then right off into the sunset? Sure. Do you want a longer career? Well, you know what I mean? So it's like, I, 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 I'm fully on board with like that philosophy. I think it makes for a more rounded person. It makes for a healthier person sure. long term, a lot more stability, a lot less chance of injury, a lot less chance of that burnout. Sure. But if you're a dude like Villapoto just to play devil's advocate yeah. and you come in and you won four straight titles and then went peace and yep. you got more money than you ever going to need to spend in the life then like maybe that shit was worth it well take a paradigm shift because i like the fact that you're playing devil's advocate but I'll, i want to run with that what i always say to my athletes when we start any program and when i say athlete anyone's listening to this if they're a mom of three that's trying to lose weight you're mm. an athlete okay because physiology nutrition doesn't matter if doesn't you're swinging matter, a yeah. bat riding a bike racing a motorcycle here's the thing i always say is why are you doing it in the physiology world we call it volition Mm. understanding why you're doing what you're doing, what motivates you to do what you do. When I when I work with a young rider and he's like, well, I just want to be wealthy. Cool, I get it. How much is enough? Yeah, that's exactly right. So Villapoto may have said X amount, hit it, see a piece out, drop the mic and walk away. That's somebody who hit his number and said, I'm done. Whether that career, you and I can sit and talk about it, whether mm. that's four, six or eight years, he hits his number, drops the mic and walks away. We don't hear from him again. Awesome. 
but I've never had somebody that could tell me why they were doing what they were doing. Mm. It's usually based out of a fear, fear of failure. Maybe it's a guilty pleasure. I, I ate bad food, so I'm going to punish myself with exercise. So now you've got to try to break that cycle. I don't have an education, so I have to do this. And now as soon as it becomes I have to do this, the fun factor's gone. Mm. You know, if you started getting paid to train every day, the fun factor goes away. Dude, which, works, works, which I man. Understand. That's why we don't call it play. Yeah, and I understand that as long as you can say to me, all right, our goal is I can make $100,000 per podium. I get a $1.5 million bonus for Supercross. I want to make $22 million. We can do that in three years. We might take us 13 years. Mm. But once we hit that number, you're like, drop the mic, I'm out. I'm in. I get that. And I think that's where you, like you were saying, what is that? That's what the individual wants. Yeah. But nobody asks the hard questions because that's why I like, I, I personally like to be able to educate people and say, dude, you've got to be able to do this on your own. Yeah. You can call me anytime. I'm not here to be your per- perennial man friend forever. Understand what satisfies appetite. You're done. Understand shop to perimeter. You're done. Understand how to read biofeedback indicators. You don't need me. You can call me for, hey, maybe you're doubting yourself. Yeah. But nobody wants to empower people. I want to make you dependent on me. If I can yeah. make you dependent, oh, I got But cash. I know I know with Ryan for sure that I I think he wanted to from what I've gathered from speaking to him. Sure. He wanted to go to Alden and just have no fucking worries. Mm-hmm. Just literally do what he's told, be like militant. Yep. Obviously Alden has a military background. Yep. Just be militant and just and that gave him enough peace of mind to win. And that's the that's the perfect fit. Mm. You take these box of needs and you take this structure yeah, that's, and you yeah. put those two together. Because that's what Dunge wanted, man. I think Dunge always looked over the fence mm-hmm. and saw him winning titles with Ricky. Then he saw him winning titles with James. Then he saw him winning titles with RV. Yep. And looked over the fence. And in his mind, he convinced himself that if he just had that program, yep. then that's what he needed to win because he didn't have any other, anything else that he had to think about. And I think that Dunge is the kind of guy that's got a lot of inner turmoil, a lot of mental stuff going on. And I think that was really evident to me when we spoke after he retired, mm-hmm. that like he retired, he just didn't know what to do. Right. Like he didn't really know who Ryan Dungey was that wasn't Ryan Dungey sure. number five. Yep. And I think that like I could see that after the racing but that had to be there during the racing sure if it's there after it's there during right. and it's like that guy just needed to just he just and I think as well like there's even you can see like the religious side of that mm-hmm. he does the same thing in the religious side I'm gonna give my life to God mm-hmm. and then God's gonna More show me the way and then he has faith yep so I think that there's a you have a guy that has that kind of faith sure. in his life yep and you've got a guy that's all like a god figure of championships yep. and wins and you've got a guy that wants to win sure he's just going to give his faith to that guy so it's like yeah i mean but we didn't get a lot of ron dungy right. and it's like is is he gonna look back and go ah oh, man you know like i missed the races maybe a couple of years would have been good like it's a really it's just a weird game that everyone's playing and i look at you said too before that like a lot of these guys aren't super educated right like i look at michael essie and i got to be around him a little bit through jdr that we used to ride at his tracks at victorville yeah and i just saw an empty kid man Mm -hmm. like i just saw an empty shell of a guy that literally had a drill sergeant dad that brainwashed him sure like straight brainwashed man and i haven't i haven't spoken about it on the podcast before but like that was such a weird thing to to witness to yeah. stand there and see the interactions between Jeff, Mike, his dad, and Mike's a super nice dude, mm-hmm. super nice guy. But like, you had that amateur Mike that was like winning, 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 so fulfilled. Sure, because like he didn't really have anything else but winning. Yep. And then you move up, and then he wasn't liked by people. He become like this weird joke, yeah. you know, broke across Joe Alessi. Right. Like everyone started calling him Joe. Yep. Then he can't win a championship to save his life, even though he's being the best sure. dude. And it's just like this, oh, you're just this empty shell. And again, like you said, like, what's the why? He mm-hmm. didn't have a why. Right. All he had was like, I need to win. Right. Everything feels good when I'm winning, but there was nothing underneath. There was no foundation of like, him as a dude it's it's and that's i think what may maybe makes me think about 
why these guys are so willing to just do this shit that doesn't make sense sure because what they're doing their existence doesn't make a lot of sense like they've just yeah. they've gone down this road and they're so far down this road yep. and there's like all they have is winning everything in their life is about winning and when it doesn't happen the wheels come off hard. the wagon hard and that's I, like i've got so much respect for a guy like dean wilson mm -hmm. who did a lot of winning as a kid was the hot prospect yep. won a championship as a pro and then the wheels fell off the wagon in a massive way and now you're seeing what why everyone likes dean wilson that dude's a rounded human now yep he's a fighter he lost yep he went out of the spotlight he lost all his rides he yep. didn't have the money coming in and he figured out who dean wilson that's was. right and i think that's why now you're seeing a guy that there's like a 2.0 sure because now there is a little bit of why behind what he does sure well and you go back to the alessi example i don't know if mike his dad i don't know did his, did his dad race at all i don't know much about his he dad was like or. i'm pretty sure he was like a flag flagger kind of guy like okay. i think he's always just been like a Better super rounded. fan yeah okay someone was telling me a story of him at paris and i, I wish i could remember the exact story i won't i sort of won't go into it because i don't remember yeah. the exact thing but of him just being like this crazy super fan flagger at Paris and gotcha. like his whole goal, he used to tell people like, I'm going to have these kids and they're going to be champions. Yep. Like, so like it was this obsession that his dad had that then molded into the kids and then the mum was out of the picture yeah. and then so there was no other influence. Like, But take that right there though. Remember what I was saying? It's not about me. It's about the athlete identifying what they want. Mm. I don't care if it's being two seconds faster a lap or being a mile an hour faster on a bicycle identify those first and build a program around the person not mm. about the trainer so here you have dad doesn't he just is enamored by the idea of having some champion kids at any expense even if he's the wacko dad and we all know he was like you say becomes even the mark mockery of it right yeah the thing that i always think is interesting is you have an uneducated an uneducated person i don't know what his degrees are but in regards to what it takes to become a champion that is in a system that loves you when you win will ostracize you when you lose mm. and then they have no rudder on their boat that when the system cuts them off they're out there floating around and don't know what to do and then mm. you see the drug addiction the alcohol abuse and all the other dangers that come in you know when when ac got turned in uh, went into the pro class i got a call from a, a foreign magazine that said how's ac gonna do i said i'll do great i said and i thought this was a pretty cool journalist he said what's your biggest fear for him and I said, to be honest with you, my biggest fear is what happens when he has his first injury. Mm. Because the whole time I had him as an amateur, the Never only bone he injuries. broke was his coccyx bone. He looped out and he broke the sip, you know, the right where your butt is at. And there's no, it's not like you cast it. You just literally yeah, you don't sit, mm. you know. And I always said my concern would be is if he ever becomes too frail, because I always worked on him trying to bounce, not break when he hits the ground. It goes back to strength and functional flexibility. Mm. I didn't know what he was doing with his other trainers. That's That was none of my business. He moved on and, and I had to respect that. But then he goes and he bounces off the wall in that European Supercross and cracked. Dude, I was right there. Oh. I stood right there when he crashed. He throttled. Right. Mate, I cannot... I cannot tell you how good he was riding. Yeah. It was, I, I was filming that, yeah. that race yeah. and I wasn't filming, dude. Here. I was watching him. I was going, holy fuck. Watch this. Adam Cincerello yeah. is doing some James Stewart shit I right now. It. Like he, he got a, a bad start and he was like coming through the, or maybe, no, I think he went down in like the first turn or something like that yeah. where he come through the pack. I've never seen a dude ride the way he was riding. That's awesome. It was incredible. And then that crash, you can just, you, mm. you know when like the way that they moved and fell and yeah. then the way that they stayed on the ground, Not good. you could tell it was, it was bad and he was, he was properly hurt. But oh, I was so devastated, man. I stood the, it was an on off section, I'm pretty sure. And he clipped another dude and then it, he whiskied like the guy kind of clipped, it's like he clipped his arm, yeah. forced him to roll that throttle on right. and then just looped out mm. all super awkward. And I was at the start and it was the, the section that come mm. on and I was just gutted because the way he was riding that motorcycle was just phenomenal. Phenom and I'd been to Alden's a bunch sure. and I'd been doing mo like filming him do motos. Never seen a kid ride like that. Yeah. It was so insane. I was so devastated for well, him. Well, the thing that I think is so interesting is goes back to the Michael Lessi dad situation who, what did he do to build resiliency? I'll give you an AC story. 
that falls right in line with why I felt AC would be fine if he could learn how to deal with not, you know, he got all the baby Jesus and all this other stuff. I got news for you. The kid earned everything he got. Mm. The fact that Mitch invested in him was just a business decision, but he wasn't, you know, they call him baby Jesus. I thought was uncalled for because the kid worked his butt off Mm. and he was extremely talented. And my only concern was, would he have that resiliency and not lose focus uh, because he'd never, I don't care to anybody, so like I was saying earlier, you got to look backwards to look forwards until you break an arm and go through a cast in the rehab. Yeah. You don't know what it takes to get through that until you go through it. I call it the familiarity principle. But AC's dad took him down to a track in South Florida and um, you know they live up in Port Orange, a couple hour drive down, maybe three, four hours even. And they got down there and, and, and what Alan's thing was is AC had to pack his gear bag. Mm. Alan would put the bikes in the van. That's why he's on super minis. But AC had to pack his bag. They get down there and Adam had forgotten a glove. And so Alan said, well, you obviously don't take this serious enough. You need to bag your stuff back up. We're heading back home. And Adam was in tears. You know, dad, no, I'm sorry. He says, you just. Alan's pretty hot, dude. Alan is, he's an accountability guy. Yeah. And he said to him, he said, look, you just lost this day to be 1% better than everybody else. And if you can't pay attention to those types of details, then how are you going to pay attention to the other? And I think it comes back full circle. He's teaching him those hard lessons instead of keeping him in a bubble, thinking that he's better than everybody else. He's entitled to all this stuff. And I'm not comparing AC's dad, Alan, to Mike's dad at all. Yeah. But I'm saying when you do get hit with adversity and, you know, when Mike started to fall out of being that, you know, that mini kid sensation with his own Honda commercials and everything else, where's the kid going to go? Mm. He's so used to everybody doting all over him and rolling out the red carpet and all that. But then all of a sudden a few injuries and a couple wrong decisions with your, you know, whether it's people yelling at DeCosta and, you know, things don't go well under the awning. But the bottom line is, is Adam, I think, is in a, it has always been. Christy, his mom, and, and even his sister, as much as they joke about him, kind of being kibitzing with his sister. It's a very tight-knit family. Oh, they're super, super close. Super tight. But they teach him life's lessons. I mean, drive, can you imagine as a dad, you just drove four hours down? They seem like a normal family they when are. they're together. That was something that I always... Um, like I noticed straight away, like right. you hang around with Tony and Jeff yeah. and Mike and you're like, that's not like Healthy. a normal right. thing that they're going on. Yeah. But like you get around with Alan and Adam and the, that family. Yep. And even though they're at the track, yeah. they're like, they're, a, they are a normal family. There's a dynamic that goes sure. on that, that isn't like this. Uh, I, I just don't think that I don't, I've never got the sense that Alan has ever looked at Adam is like this meal ticket kind of thing no. or we better protect our investment. Right. Like that, that's a vibe that I've never got off them. That's right. Well, and, and I, I shared this with you coming back from the airport. When I was in college, I was doing quantitative statistical analysis. Yeah, I wanted to analysis. get in how to like this whole thing happened. So like, we should go back to the start of that. Okay. So like how did you get into the statistical analysis and then go from that to like being a physiologist? Okay. Well, We'll go back a little bit further then. If yeah, you want yeah, to go there. yeah. We got to go back a little so bit. So I, I started riding in 78 and uh, got my first motorcycle in 78. And we raced up to uh, 81 and we have a pretty big family. And my dad's like, hey, moto is just too expensive. And a buddy of ours was racing BMX. He's like, let's give this a shot, you know. And he fell in love with BMX because, hey, you could buy one bike and ride it for three years. You know, there's no oil and chains and everything. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so to make a long story short, I got into BMX and then I ended up getting eighth in the world and at the IBM XF Worlds. And as soon as those worlds were over, I had signed a letter of intent with a team in California and I had all intentions of moving to California. Little side note, one of the guys that I raced against on a regular basis was Big E from Yoshimura. So we were traveling the country and racing and all and did the worlds and I thought I was going to move to California and become a racer full time. And my dad, he's a military guy. What he said you kind of mm. didn't, I mean, he didn't, didn't mince words. He said, Hey, great. And he didn't want to argue. Oh gosh, no, no, yeah. you, that, that would be painful. And you're a pretty big dude. So like, is your dad a pretty big dude as well? Um, he, because I'm adopted, you know, he's, oh, it's, you know, yeah, he's, that's right. he's, he's a big guy, but he wouldn't say he'd be like an MMA yeah, okay. big guy. Yep, yep. He kind of was just, he just had that edge about him. So to make a long story short, he drives my tail end down to a community college and just parks in the parking lot and points at the admin building and says, go figure it out. I didn't know what a credit hour was. I know anything about it. Right. But I just went in and did it. And so I went and got my A degree and go off to the University of Central Florida. And I wasn't on a track to go to school. So I literally, dad's like, you're going to go get a degree in computer science. So I went and got a degree in computer science. You're going to go get a degree in human resource management. And I went and got one in that. And then he's like, all right, I want you. And so I got several degrees because that's what dad said to do. 
And my dad was a district manager for 7-Eleven, which is Southland Corporation. So he's kind of that guy. You get into a career, like it or not, you, you stay there, up, you retire, there. and that's it. Yeah. Get your 40, 4, 4K, 401K, whatever. 401K, 401K yep. yeah. So All dad, that bullshit. Yeah, exactly. So dad, dad puts me through school, and his thing was, as long as you got A's and B's, I'd pay for it, and if you don't. And uh, so while I was in college there, I was doing quantitative statistical analysis for a supermarket chain in Orlando, and it was a small chain, but I was doing the behind the scenes, doing the number crunching for the stores. And the CEO of the company, his name was Mike Cianciarillo. And he just happened to have a grandson that had just picked up this P-Dub. And his son, Alan, was one of our store directors. Hmm. Well, I've been in Moto since 78. I didn't know much about Alan or Adam, obviously. And so at this point, I'm old enough. I've got my two little guys. We get a TTR 90 and a TTR uh, 50. And we go to the track and, you know, we run into Alan and Alan and I had worked together at the business level, but not at the racing level. So we, Hey man, how you doing? It's good to see you that whole nine yards. So we just kind of catch up and, uh, little did I, you know, I didn't know that Alan had his Cobra career, excuse me, Adam had his Cobra career and all that other stuff. So one thing leads to another, while I'm in college, I start doing triathlons because, you know, I'm racing bikes. I know how to race a bike pretty well, but I'm not going to do nothing with it. So I started doing triathlons. The guy I was living with, we lived on a lake. He was doing Ironman New Zealand. I'm like, I'll learn how to swim. And I ran cross country a little bit before I got into bikes. So next thing you know, I'm on the junior development team for the sport of triathlon at the Olympic Training Center and come back home and I get hit by a car. I was taking a buddy to the airport and get, get pummeled in a car wreck. Blows my left knee out. Well, unfortunately, you're a lame duck. You're off the team. You know, there's mm. so many people that want to get into it. So I was off and I'm like, well, what do I do now? You know, I've got these. So I went back to school, got a degree in massage therapy and dad was big on education. So it was kind. He paid for that. Got a degree in massage therapy and started fuddling around a little bit with exercise fizz. And dad goes, well, just go get your master's degree in exercise fizz. I'll pay for it. So ended up with a degree in exercise fizz. But while I was at the Olympic Training Center, I got just exposed to stuff that just didn't make sense. You know, I'm sitting here eating a no fat, high carb diet, you know, training mm. my butt off three times a day, sleeping four hours a night because I'm, I'm in this, you know, only did I realize I was running myself into adrenal fatigue. And one night I was getting, I went to bed and we set our alarm to go off at five and the alarm went off and I picked it up and I shoved it right through the, the drywall. And I remember laying back and just stealing up my ceiling fan. I go, this is wrong. It's just something's really wrong. Fast forward, go to the Olympic Training Center. He tells me I've got adrenal fatigue. You need to eat more protein and fat. Body fat drops. Things are going great. And then the accident happens. And so that career's mm -hmm. over. So now I'm sitting here and I'm like, okay, I've got these degrees. I love exercise science. I don't really want to stay in the corporate world. And a couple of buddies of mine were into tennis real big. So they're like, hey, will you put a speed and agility program for us? That took off, started doing really well. Then I get a phone call. My ex-wife's cousin is Tim Cotter, who runs the MX Sports amateur side. Yeah. And Timmy calls me and says, hey, I've got this opportunity with Toyota. They're doing this moving forward program. And what the program was is they were going to select 10 riders. They were going to have them race for a year. They were going to have a jury of eight or 10 judges that were going to determine who was going to get this spot. And if you got the spot, it was a guaranteed ride with the Motorsport Kawasaki team. That year, Sean Hackley ended up winning that. But while I was working with that Toyota program, I got to work with Kyle Chisholm, Mike Pacone, some of these really cool top amateur guys. And that kind of opened the door for me in the motocross world because I didn't want to get into it. Mm. I, I love, I'm, a, I'm probably one of the biggest fans of the sport. I love the sport. And you know, like anything, if you get into it, you get a little jaded, you get a little too yeah. close to it. And I don't want to sound like a superstar, but you go to the races and, hey, watch my kid, can you help me figure this yeah. out? Or everybody's got a question about it. And I get it, you know, but I like to go ride with my son. You know, I've got, I've got, like I said, two boys at the time and I have my own 250 and we'd, we'd love to go ride at PAX and stuff. So I'm like, Tim, all right, I'll do it. Get the program going with Toyota. Then next thing I find, you know, that starts taking off on some traction there. And so then I get a chance to work with Matt Bonney, got a chance to work with Kyle Chisholm. Then Chiz gets picked up and goes over to Sam Manuel. So now I'm training at Stewart's mm. place with, with Chiz while he's with Alden. The other guy. Yeah. And it was a great relationship because Alden was working with James at the time I had Chiz. And we would just work different parts of the track. And we never worked out with them. They never worked out with us. And so that just kind of built from there where I picked up Chiz and picked up Bonnie. Then I picked up Ashley Filek. Then it just started snowballing from there. And then out of the blue, Alan calls me and says, hey, we need to get together. Well, I hadn't really paid much attention to that mm. side. I mean, of course, I knew about him and stuff. He's like, let's let's put something together. 
So I picked up Adam, started putting Did some you, structure. How old was he when you... That's a great question. I, I get that asked quite a bit. I know we were still on super mini days. I mean, he was obviously full blown team green at that time. Um, I can't remember what that year was. Do you have was, any you know? like reservations with working with like young kids? Absolutely. You know, the Cause problem- it's gotta be, it's gotta be weird. Like, yeah, un- I understand why it's necessary, Yep. but you do take something from a kid when you treat them like a professional athlete in a way but then i look at adam and knowing him like he's probably the kid that made it out the best right you know and i mean like same with like cooper and mm-hmm. like that i think that that generation of kids yeah. sort of they they seem like they figured it out sure but you you can't like whether the juice is worth the squeeze or not yeah regardless you are taken away from a kid yeah. so you can take away and it, have it be worth it on the backside, right? Like Adam Cincerello. Sure. But you can take away from a kid and have it not be worth it, like a Michael Essie. Yep. So it's like, I mean, I'm sure for you there would have been a little bit of conflict there to be like there treating is, a kid like an athlete. It's in that interesting way. that you went down that thought because I actually hadn't thought about it that way. When I look at a young athlete, like I have Trevor Best with uh, Yamaha right now, and on the top end, I I just picked up Seth Hamaker with Kawasaki. You have two ends of the spectrum. You have a little guy that's on a 65, 85, and you've got a guy that's... See, that seems crazy yeah. that a kid on a 60 is like, yeah. but got here, a dude crunching numbers. But here's the part that makes it hard. We're in a sport that requires the child to be able to push and pull a motorcycle around at speed. There's mm. no other sport like it. So if you were, if a, if a soccer mom or a ball and stick and sport mom came to me and said, should Johnny lift weights? No, his growth plates, it's going to cause a lot of problems. But yet then we turn right around and throw him on a super mini that's ripping. Mm. And we say, well, we don't want him to get hurt. We don't want the bike to ride him. We want him to be able to ride the bike. So he's got to be strong. Now, I don't want to stunt growth. I don't want to mess up with the growth plates. So I try to make fun. I try to make fitness fun. Mm. Um, take him over to a, a playground and, and, and play freeze tag with him. The stop and the starting and the, the explosion, it's going to build strength. It's going to build endurance, but we're not stunting growth. Throw them on a monkey bar and challenge them on how many pull-ups they can do. They don't even see it as fitness, mm. but you keep it fun. Grab a moto pogo, do 25 of those, run down the street, do 25 push-ups, come back, moto pogo, do that five times. It's fitness. So that's the kind of stuff that you were doing with With the AC. little guys, exactly. Oh, that's interesting. And then, you know, we would do, a, we would do not to be rude, but as puberty got closer and the testosterone started to drop in and we knew the growth plates weren't going to get stunted, you could start doing a little bit more load bearing exercise. But at the same time, and I'll say this as sincerely as I can, I was always trying to get him ready for a 125. Mm -hmm. When I'm working with someone on a super mini, it's always the next class. And when you're on a 250, it's the 450. And when you're on a fast 250, it's for a factory rig. We just did that with Isaac Teasdale. He came through our amateur development program. As I said, we own our own amateur team. And what we do is we pick kids out of the top 10 that are willing to try to figure out what it takes because they don't have all of the you know perks. So the idea is I always want the athlete to be at a, at a performance level that supersedes the bike they're currently on. Mm. And, it, and that's hard because sometimes they're like, oh, we're doing too much. Well, you say you're going to go to the 125. Yeah, you're about you to better do a whole be ready. Lot more, yeah. yeah. And I think that's an irresponsibility of a lot of trainers is they train to the moment, which I get, but you've got to, got to, you got to meld the two very gently. Especially when you've got time when a dude's on a super mini. Right. You know? Well, and like you said, you don't want to make it to where it's not fun and they lose the childhood. We don't want them to lose sight of the fact that they've got a privilege to race a dirt bike. And then when you put on top of that, when you do have a talent like an AC, I had the privilege of working with Ian Treadle. I had him through his amateur career, you know, to see somebody that's got that talent, you know, whether it's an Ian Treadle or, you know, you don't want them to burn out and be the the fastest guy at Loretta's that never was, but yet you you need to get them that opportunity with a ride. That's like you said, Bobby Hewitt. I love the fact that like I worked with Jordan Bailey all through his amateur career. He's a super cool kid. Eh? He's very cool. Yeah. And you know, Bobby picked him up and Bobby put him on there and is cultivating him. And it's that is like the best scenario when you can when you can cultivate a kid and from that far from out. that far out, and then you see him develop as a person, as a human being, as a um, a, a human being who's hit puberty, they can they can take on incrementally more and more. Most trainers don't want to do that. They want the limelight. I want the championships now because mm. I never made it about me. I was for, I was forever thankful for what we were accomplishing. Well, the thing is, is like, because I always say that, like, and even you know, I'll get in an argument with my brother or something. I'll be yeah. like, "Hey, man, I'm not saying this for me. Right? I got no. I got. There's nothing that I can 
Like I don't have anything to gain out of That's this. Right. If I'm telling you something and I've like got some shit to gain, yep. then it's like, then think about it. Yep. But it, in your case, it's like what you have to gain is like them doing good. That's right. Like you're only invested in their success. Like there's no, and that's where I always would give people advice when they have other people. I'm like, stop listening to people sure. that have like, to say the man friend that's mm-hmm. coming in and telling you how to do your job or that you're doing something wrong. Right. Is that only for you? Or is there an option for that dude to then, when he fires you, to go, hey, man, look, in the interim to get another guy, I'll take care of it. Exactly. You know what I mean? So it's like you've you've really got to, when you are in that space, you've got to really think about like, all right, what are all the angles here? And who's saying this? And what have they got to gain on on either side? And And I think that the trainer is like, you, the the writing's on the wall. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like, and that's why I think that the way you're saying it, like the zeros and ones. Well, that's like why you said earlier. Obvious. Well, that's why it becomes frustrating because I pour into them as if they're my own child. I tell the parents all the time. I said this to Alan and Christy. He's your son before he becomes the elite racer. Mm. I have two boys and a little girl. Their health will always precede. You're not going to be a cog in someone's system at the expense of my son. That's or what I love health. about Bobby. And, yeah. and and I think Tyler Keith's like that too. Tyler's a really good He's guy. He's another dude that's yeah. like that. And I and I'll, I talk about Bobby a lot, but like that, I know that dude on a human level mm-hmm. and he treats everybody the same. Totally agree. I had a chance you to know, work with him. And with Tyler's Ian. the same. Yep. Um, and then when uh, Jordan went over there, I got a chance to, you know, talk to, I ran into Bobby at Daytona and stuff. And even though they have their own program with Alden and all that, you know, Bobby and I, we talk mm. and, and that's, I mean, I'm not saying like we talk on a daily basis. I'm saying when we see at the races, yeah, yeah. we say hi. It's not like, oh, you're not our trainer kind of a thing. Yeah. He's a real dude. And, uh, you know, going back to like you were saying earlier, the challenge that you run into is what is the purpose? You know, my role, I, I, I'll go on the public record again and say motocross is my smallest business segment, mm. but I love it. Yeah, it's such a, isn't it crazy, man, that how motocross just sit like, and even me, like I don't. I don't really want to film no, yeah. no shit. I don't really want yeah. to go to tracks, but you bet your ass as soon as we hang up on this podcast, we're going straight home to watch exactly. the Supercross replay. Absolutely. And I'll like, I'll text all the dudes that I know, whether you just want to say I'm name right. dropping or not. So I text it. those guys and yep. I say, good luck boys. And if they do fucking shit, yep. I still text them. I'm like, still pump for you, dude. That's right. Like you, there's something about it that it does. It never leaves you. No, no, and and weird, so when man. people say, oh, it's for the money. I'm like, no, it's not. I, there's I do so it. much more money in other sports. Well, and, and, and unfortunately, our sport has the biggest need for this type of information. Mm. These kids need to bounce and not break. These kids need to have fun, et cetera, and everything we've talked about. But you take it a step further. You go into my, I call it the pain den. That's where Michaela and I have our bikes, and that's where we do our trainer workouts. I have a picture. It's one of those frames that has one, two, three over. The top one is me and DeCoster. The middle one is Ricky and my two boys when they were five and three. And then the bottom one is me and Jeff Stanton. And the way that that happened was, I went to the Orlando Supercross. That was the last race that Ricky did. Tim Cotter was nice enough. And again, you got to remember at this point, I'm doing nothing with the sport of motocross. I'm Mm. there as a fan. Yeah. And Timmy takes us in there and got a chance to, I I, want to bounce around. First thing that happened during the day was I've always had the utmost respect for Roger. So Tim says, Hey, come with me. goes over. Roger's got He's working for Suzuki. I get a picture. That was like the highlight of the day. Then he says, hey, Bevo wants us in the Scott rig. So we go on the Scott rig, and I'm just sitting there. Sure enough, Stanton walks in. I'm like, oh, you know, I'm like a, a groupie. I'm like, ah. Oh. So he, you know, get the old token picture with Stanton, and he doesn't know me from Adam, you know? Yeah. And then Timmy says, hey, let's go say hi to Ricky. And that's when Ursula just had the twins, and he flew in on the Arnett helicopter. And, yeah. And Ricky's this last race against James. And I'll be darn, man. Ricky's just like, hey, man, what's going on? Like, like he's at Dade City. You yeah. know what I mean? We're sitting on the stoop of the of the rig, and there's Caleb at the bottom, and Josh is next to him, and they're just grinning from me. And Ricky's just so calm, cool, and collected. And yeah. he's got his fox gear on. You know, and in 15 minutes, he's going to do opening ceremonies and go dog with James, you know? My point is this. I've got Ricky's phone number. I've got Stanton's phone number. I, I then was selected to, to start talking at the RCU. So I talked at Ricky's Carmichael's, you know, the RCU yeah. Daytona race. Had the privilege of being there for five years till they discontinued the classes. Got a chance to then meet, you know, Stanton and just be a dude in the sport with Stanton. Yeah. And then I get to meet Jeff. You know, when I was doing the Toyota thing, they flew me out to Ponca and we did our world minis, excuse me. And they flew me out. Emig and I did a presentation and then they flew me home. So now all of a sudden Jeff and I are buds, you know, and I'm thinking, 
this has really turned into something unique. The guys that I idolize, I'm still a fan of the sport. Mm. I don't, I don't care about someone's last name when it comes to, you know, oh, I get to work with so and so. I'm very blessed. I got number one plates in every single sport we do. It's not about the name. It's not about size of bank account. It's it's cool that you know I can I can text Dunge and say hey congratulations on your little one. Mm. You know what I mean? That's what matters to me at the end of the day. Hey Germ, how you doing with your back surgery, man? Are you doing okay? You know I'm not ever stepping my bounds with what he does with Tomac. Mm. You know, and my point in all of that is is when you start to realize I just am a fan of the sport. Mm. But now I am I do some work at Ricky's Goat Farm. That's incredible. I get to hang with Jeannie. We went up and had dinner with Big Rick and and Jeannie. You know, and just went up and had dinner with them. Uh, you go over and you go to an RCU and you get to hang with Emig and, and Stanton and those guys. And I get a chance to talk to the Suzuki camp. And then Stanton steps up and goes, listen to what he's saying. Mm. That's coming from Stanton, a guy that I've idolized for 20 years. And he's standing up and says, if I had what Rob just gave you guys, I would have had a longer career. I mean, it gives me goosebumps. Mm. You know what I mean? It's that's that I, I love. That's I, the stuff that really matters. That's what really matters. Yeah. That's what keeps me coming back on a sport that I fight an uphill battle every day because I'm too technical or I'm, mm. I'm not here to be somebody's man friend. And you are right. Like in, if you go into other sports, like, like say for instance, like the UFC, like they've got a multi million dollar performance Institute, you know, facility yep. where yep. they're going through all the numbers and they're doing everything. Like you, you just can't be naive to think that, you know, ah, this is all just bullshit. Blah, right. blah, blah. Like you think the NFL is just like, going how do you feel this morning man yeah exactly push through bro yep. toughen up yep. you know like that like bro science is gone it's from gone. stuff and and it's just the way it is and but you're right there is that mentality and look at the end of the day dude motocross is a redneck sport <laughs> and like that was one of the yeah. things like not to talk shit yep. on it but i was very when i was a guy that went from australia to the u.s and it was 2010 and yeah. i was expecting the bright lights and the trucks and, and that's all there mm -hmm. but the dudes walking through the pits have got fox tattoos and mullets yeah absolutely and it's like that we're not playing to this high-end like cycling right if you're a cyclist you're a doctor you're a lawyer that's right. you know what i mean yeah. there's these different demographics yep. that you play to and i think that it's so easy to have like these blanket overviews of yeah. like what a sport is and you see like what you see is like that one percent that's right of motocross right yeah and then you'll see like the glitz and the glamour and a1 and the trucks and the perfectly polished you know everything yeah but it's like behind that it's like what's made up of that what's the foundation it's the blue collar barely affording a dirt bike yep you know they've they're not super educated guys and yeah you get these one percent kids and they're the ones that make it to the top but unfortunately no, unfortunately, like it is what it is, sure. is that the people that are bringing those people up yep. and are still there when they get to the top, they're not super educated dudes, but you don't get that in tennis. Right. You, you get a kid that grew up in a country club. That's right. And with golf, you get a kid that grew up at a country club. Yeah. Cycling, you get these doctors and then, and then those people spend more money and then there's the, the whole economy of that sport is healthier, which means they're more open-minded to the science. They've spent more money on it. They've spent more time on it. You're a guy that's, lived in those worlds that comes from that place that has all of the scientists working and yep. then you try and bring that over to moto yep. you're automatically pushing shit uphill Absolutely. because you're with a crowd of people that comes from literally comes from the mud right and it's not talking shit it's no, not no it's de reality degrading like that is where the sport come from well, i said it same earlier. as nascar well i said it earlier i mean their answer is stiffer suspension faster motors yeah you know they'll, they'll go spend eight thousand dollars on a modded motor for loretta's but you know, our, our monthly fee of a couple hundred bucks a month is mm -hmm. cost prohibitive. It yeah. just blows my mind. And, the, and, you know, you said something that I thought was pretty insightful as well. When you look at the idea that my goal is like, for example, we started our amateur development team 13 years ago. And what our goal was is to take 10 kids out of the top 10, as I said earlier, and we've been very fortunate. We've got six D helmets. We've got shades of gray. We've got Canvas MX doing our own custom Moto E gears. Decal yeah, Works are doing our Moto E graphics for the bike. We've got great partners from head to toe. We've got A and W that's doing our motor work, giving the motor work to these kids for forty five percent off. My point is this: those sponsors said, Rob, we like, for example, Liet Steph over at Liet. She said, I wish my brother had the opportunity you're giving these kids. I was like, mm. wow, somebody gets it. 
shades of gray. Josh, he gets it. He's like, wow, I like what you're doing. You use the word economics. That's exactly what I always say. I'm going to put my money where my mouth is. I put over $250,000 a year into this team on purpose. Mm-hmm. I'm not trying to drop numbers. I want people to understand it, but I'm gonna, I want to elaborate why. The idea here is these kids wouldn't be able to get to Steph. They wouldn't be able to get to these guys. We have VP race gas. We have mm-hmm. renegade gas. We have from literally everything you spend money on going racing, we have a partner to save you money. And I say to these young kids, this year for 10 spots, we only bring on 10 kids. We had 3,300 plus resumes for That's 10 crazy, spots. That's eh? crazy, So you know the parents recognize it's expensive. Yeah. You take it a step further. Now all of a sudden at the end of the year, they've spent X amount of dollars going racing, but then they saved $6,500 plus my coaching program. I say to the young kids, it's because of your integrity, your willingness not to give up, and this whole idea that you're not going to whine because you're not the next, let's call it AC, baby Jesus. Yeah. But these kids all love it and they flourish under it. My point is this, what I only request of the team is they have to keep their body analysis, which is their resting heart rate in the morning, their body weight in the morning and the evening, and their hours of sleep. We take body measurements every six weeks and we do field testing every six weeks. I'm building a medical database behind the scenes. So Uh. when a Bobby calls me and says, how heavy does somebody need to be? Why do I do that? Because Mitch Payton called me and asked me, didn't call me personally. He want to know, could Adam move to a 250? Yeah, right. Bobby wants to say, hey, this guy's, this guy's got what, does he have what it takes? That Bobby doesn't call me and say, I want you to work with Jalik Swall. Jalik Swall works with Tim Ferry. But I have a responsibility to the sport for myself. I'm not getting paid by to do this. If Roger calls me, if Bobby calls me, and they want to know, hey, does this kid have what it takes physiologically to move to a factory bike? I don't want to put a child on there that we know doesn't have the functional strength mm. to be able to hold on to that bike. He goes out and yard darts himself. I would be absolutely gutted. Mm. So my goal for the last 13 plus years has been, we collect the data. I'm gonna build a medical database that I can give to Dr. Berg, uh, who does all the athletes up in Tallahassee, the surgeon, whoever needs it. Let me hand, you know, I want, I'm not as, I'm yeah, not an asterisk super, medical group at all. Cool. But the idea that, now here's the catch. We were talking about on the way back from the airport. I'm all about accountability and responsibility. If you can't fill that form out for me every week, yeah, you're, imme- yeah. you're immediately dropped from the team. Yeah. And, it, and it's not a threat. Give back to the sport. I'm pouring into you. You pour back into the sport. And it's simple. That's it. Yeah. And your heart rate data on your watch gives us 95% of that data. Yeah. The rest of it we use is just an Excel spreadsheet that my programmers have programmed. I've been doing this for 35 years. We know how to look at and cross-validate the numbers, as we said earlier. Mm. Once we build that profile, yes, I can help you decide. You said it. That's why I thought it was pretty interesting you brought it up. What what do you do with a young kid? Mm. Should you have them lift weights? Well, unfortunately, you're going to take your son from an 85 to a 250F. That's a huge, huge step. Yeah. You know, 125s are kind of lost in the shuffle. Yeah. But the idea here is, <clears throat> excuse me, that's my vision. My vision is to build a team where the manufacturers are like, dude, this is the future. I want the Wassermans of the group to say, who are you putting out? Yeah. Because then that child may get a better chance. We might be able to fast track them. I'm here in Australia. I want to share what we have. I want to share what we do. I want to share our methodologies. Mm. I want kids to have, to say to themselves, hey, can I possibly make a cut at the amateur level? Well, I do some stuff at the goat farm. I have, you know, again, not name dropping. We're working with JH right now, trying to get a date to do a Moto E specific camp. Hopefully that'll materialize. Ricky's schedule is pretty busy with the new TV. Talking to Mr. Baggett, trying to get something at Blake's place, maybe. That'd be super cool. Yeah, well, just so that way I've got one in Tallahassee, I've got one in Orlando, trying to build a winter training camp where people can come in out of the cold, train during the winter. Just looking for ways to grow the sport. Mm. I, I'm with you. I mean, if four strokes are very, very expensive. Wah, 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 wah. We're not going to change the sport. Mm. Four strokes aren't going away. But let's do what we can to make the cut. Like you said, we have kids picking up a baseball bat because it costs twenty five dollars. Mm. Who's going to go drop nine grand and say, "Hey, Johnny, let's go try moto for the first time"? Yeah. Well, let's stop talking about oh, it the and do something. Barriers to about entry it. are pretty insane. It's insane. Like. And then you add an injury. So I always say, if I can get, and I've I've said it a couple times here, if I can get them to bounce and not break, if I can get them to understand how to get strong and stay in a mode of anabolic strength and growth, and let them be able to have fun and educate themselves, and then build that in longevity. I've done my job. Mm. I'm very blessed. I can go to a Ian Treadle, an Ashley Filek, and Adam Cianciarillo. I mean, I love looking at the pro ranks now. 
I mean, ironically, I got to race against Eli's dad, John, and BMX. But you know, whether I'm I'm dealing with Eli Tomac or whether I'm dealing with AC or you know the guys that are on the gate now, and to remember working with Germ when he was on an 85, yeah, that's what makes me feel good. Knowing yeah. that they're millionaires now, that they've made it, that 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 was all worth the while. Mm-hmm. It's not about Moto E and Coach Rob. It's about Yes, I've been very fortunate to work with a lot of athletes, a lot that people don't know, and I'm cool with that because mm. it's not about me. You know, yes, I'm trying to build a brand, but I want people to understand the brand is about you guys. Mm. It's, it's not doing me any, I love what you said. It's not doing me any, you can argue with me. I'm mm. telling you this because I know it's gonna work. And you're only like, your only success or failure is judging like if the guy gets better. So why would you do anything to make anything them not but, get better? And that's where I fall out of favor, as I said at the beginning of the podcast, is people hire me to bust their kid's butt. Mm. And I look at the kid and he's got dark circles under his eyes. He's not sleeping. He's not growing muscle. If he's young and he's hit puberty and he can't get an erection, how many more red signs do you need that your child's overtrained? Yeah, yeah. And li- almost on the verge of being sick. Then you look at people who have had a chance to get onto a factory team, and you and I could sit here and make a laundry list. How many people got a two-year deal and were too tired and fatigued because of Epstein-Barr or chronic fatigue, whatever you want to call it, didn't make it to the second year? Mm. If I was their trainer and I had an athlete that I roached in year one, and I'm going to walk around like I'm something, you're an idiot is what you are. You just ruined that dude's career. Now, I'm not saying that anyone, anyone who's listening to this that knows one of those guys that didn't get to enjoy his second year, don't call his trainer and tell him yeah, that he's yeah, an idiot. Yeah. But if you're getting halfway through the season and he's getting sick frequently, he's getting injured frequently, has all these signs, why do you keep pushing him? Because you made mm. it about you. You forgot who the client was. You forgot you lost sight of the bigger picture. Or what worked for you. You know, if you're yeah. one of those, yeah. uh, like uh, Randy Lawrence, uh, Ryan Hughes guy, and again, not saying that, you know, they've done anything wrong. Sure. But their way of doing it isn't through physiology degrees and through masters and through their way of doing it is like, well, this is what made me a national champion. And that's what pisses me off. And that's that, that has to be an issue. Yeah. It's, it's a huge issue. It goes back to what I said earlier. I have a 250. Doesn't mean I should be hired by yeah. Nature Ziggy. And that's the problem that I have with it is, and I'm not going to name any names, but there was a guy that was a riding coach in Florida and I needed a riding coach. So I had this particular athlete I was working with and I brought it this X pro in and he's like oh you're eating too much protein you're eating too much this mm. and then plucked the kid out of my program and parked him on his property full time that that's the lack of couth that's the lack of mm. integrity that I have no patience for you know uh, I, that's never, just unfortunately again it's that human nature thing I, I think know? it's even more than just human nature I think it's just the incessant it's the incestuous nature mindset of, of our sport yeah where? But I think then, like, to, to I guess, like, I play devil's advocate, yeah. like, it's fucking everywhere. Oh, yeah. Like, it's, no, it is. It, it, it just is this human nature thing. And, like, you can even see different gyms taking different people, yeah. different guys going to different camps with But here's, you know, here's the thing, though. But you being yourself going into jiu-jitsu, you are running it through a filter of why you would go there. Mm. And I, I, this is not funny, but it is funny to me. When you go and you look at the reputation of a program you're going into that only has a, a track record of burning people out, and then you still walk into that headlong, you're an idiot. But then again, that's what I was saying about the the like. Let's say the Dunge thing is like you just want to not think about it. Well, you bring you up know? a good point. If you're talking pro versus up and coming amateur, yeah, I'm talking the up and coming amateur. Yeah, yeah. The pro side, like you say, there's a lot of money, and that's the, the short, career is that's short. Short sided. Yeah, yeah, it's very yeah. short. But I, I again, I think like there there is some merit to just going like that blind faith dude yep. that just doesn't uh, all I want to do like it doesn't even matter what the program is yep. in terms of physically what they're going to do just the fact that you're on that pro- program is enough of a placebo yep. to make you win well, and that I but, think that does exist but you bring up a pretty interesting question until what goes wrong that they say the program no longer works I'll yeah. give you a perfect example completely different sport sport of triathlon there's a guy, and I, I really have the utmost respect for this guy. His name's Sebastian Kinley. Had the best year of his racing career. Those were his words. Goes to Ironman Hawaii, has an Achilles tendon that rears its ugly head that he's had a problem with for several years, and at the end of that race, fired his coach. Mm. Well, we saw that in 2005 with Ricky at Motocross Nations. 
like why'd you do shit and he's like i've been overtrained blah 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 huge fallout and he's just like what you just won everything but let me ask you this what on what grounds did ricky make that comment i don't think it was emotional It was probably quantified if i know ricky well enough well it was just physical like the dude was just exhausted right but but when you when you say somebody's overtrained that's like saying somebody's ugly Without mm. quantified information, that would be that would be kind of a blasphemous statement to make. Mm. I haven't talked to Ricky about it, but I would say he probably had some concrete evidence as to why that was there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, because Ricky's right. not a shit thrower. You know, yeah. I mean, he'd rather part ways quietly. But like I say, it was pretty public knowledge that mm. the, the, it was not a very good breakup. Let's leave it at that. But I think he probably had enough evidence that probably, he realized yeah. his career has been cut short because. But would he have kept going? Do you think? I could, I'd have to ask Ricky. I don't know. Yeah, I'd be interested. Because he had a pretty know. hell of a career. That's you know? what I mean. Like, Lots what, of traveling. Yeah. What and else? Tiring. You, and that's that's as well. Like the thing that I mean, me and Slita talked about it. It's like the schedule's too gnarly. Yep. The races are too long. Both series conflict so so heavily. Both series hate each other. Yep. Can't talk to each other. The the world that Giuseppe Lago or whatever Wolfgang yeah, whatever whatever you want to call him his he hates them. That it's like. All of these promotions are out for their own thing with no consideration to the riders at all. Right. Like, I think the FIM, well, I don't know if they do it right, but like the fact that there's really no Supercross series Mm -hmm. to kind of like to tear these dudes apart, it really just says you've got to be fit enough to do 40 plus two or 35 plus two, whatever it is. is. And then you've got to do it all year. And it's like those dudes can sort of get in a rhythm. There's no like... Supercross, motocross, a couple Supercross events, a Motocross of Nations event, two week off season, back to Supercross. Da, 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 da. So it's like even I, I think when you hear the burnout thing, yeah, it's not just the training; it's the everything that comes along Absolutely. with it. Like it's too much. But I, what you just said is the key point: is it's all the variables that the human being, let's just call them the racer, has to keep in balance. And that's what you're trying to take into account of, right? With, but as soon yeah. as something goes wrong. The trainer gets thrown out because mm. the program doesn't work because the confidence gets jeopardized because the man friend that comes over that has something asinine yeah. to say based on no grounds, no quantified, it creates a whirlwind really fast and it becomes a tornado fast. And it's hard to pick what variable is responsible for. Well, but to me, I always strip the emotion from it. It's not what mm. I think the quantified and we have a full time programming department that I mean, that's what we are. We're an analytics company. We're just we're we're crunching the numbers and and looking at numbers not just at face value. We're truly mm. cross validating them to say here's the three reasons why you need to do this, not just this one. It's easy to extrapolate one and just yeah, hang your hat yeah, on it. Yeah. But you bring up another interesting component of that. What I have a problem with is let's take Jordan Bailey, who I worked with the most recently, who's turned pro. Don't act surprised, dude. They're not going to change the racing schedule for you. Mm. As as somebody who's trying to develop a super mini rider into a schoolboy, into a B class, I'm getting him ready for the shit schedule he's got to maintain because it's not going to change. No. But what I can do is prepare him that he can stay be in it to win it, make the best of a shitty situation, cash some really big checks. We're not going to change the system. Yeah. So until I jump over to the other side of the fence and start working with Davey and those guys and fix that, I'm being a smart ass when I say that, yeah. I can't, I have no influence in that. Yeah, what so you I can, can only influence, control what you can control. Right, but it's like we were saying earlier, if my son's gonna, desires and has the talent to be a professional cyclist, suck it up, buttercup, you're gonna have to go climb Alp Duez if you wanna race the tour. Yeah. Don't act surprised when you got, it's like we were Don't teasing. complain, yeah. Don't complain, but be prepared. Yeah. That's why I always want to be proactive. If we know the specificity of what we're training for, whether it's one month, three months, or three years, don't be surprised when you're keeping a crazy ass schedule because you knew it was there. Mm. It's been there whether you like it or not. And it's not going away. I want to change gears to the, sure. the adoption thing because I, if you're comfortable talking about Absolutely, it, yeah. but I just watched the uh, Instant Family yeah. last night, uh-huh. which is the movie about adoption. Okay. And uh, so basically in the movie, it's Mark Wahlberg and Rose Byrne and then they're like kind of have the midlife crisis thing. They got no kids they're living the great life. Then they're like, well, let's adopt the family. They end up adopting a 15 year old an eight year old and a three year old or four year old or whatever. And then it's sort of, that's the movie. Gotcha. But it was, it was very educational in the sense that the movie offered a lot of facts about how many kids are in foster care. Mm-hmm. And, and it, it put like a face to 
like the reality of what the kids have to deal with and like they're opening Christmas presents and the kid and it was based on a true story that actually that's probably the coolest thing to note is the director of the film yeah it's based on what him and his wife did uh-huh. so it was super real that's and cool. you could tell that this that they really knew what was going on with sure. the dynamic here so like they have Christmas there and then instead of playing with the toys they played with the boxes that the mm. toys come in and stuff like that yeah so when you said that you were adopted and what eight kids in the family yeah my adoption is a little bit different um, my mom got pregnant when she was really really young mm. and she got thrown out by her dad and so we were living in a car and she didn't really have any place to go and one thing led to another and she ended up meeting my adopted dad oh, and okay. he, yeah he, he brought he brought us out of pretty much nothing and it wasn't a sob story um, he and my mom just clicked and uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much what happened. I wasn't in the orphanage or anything yeah, like right. that. It was um, it was it a must, rough start. Yeah, it, it must a be a, a weird way to well, like not a weird way, but like you've you've got different circumstances thrown at you compared to your peers. Absolutely. And any time any kid has a different thing to deal with sure. than their peers that have a lot more in common. Yeah, kind of creates some weird stuff that you've got to navigate through at an age where you don't know a lot. Well, again, you're, you're going pretty deep, something that I'm totally cool going with if you are. Um, the brother that was older than me, I was the youngest of eight, and then the next one was 11 months older than me. So do you have any paternal siblings? No. Okay. No. And um, the thing that's interesting is my dad, as much as I love him, he, both my mom and dad are gone now, so I'm not talking behind their backs, yeah. but um, my dad was a baseball guy. He was Chicago Cubs in and out, and if it wasn't baseball, it wasn't anything. Yeah. And, uh, I just didn't, like, yeah, I just didn't like baseball. And first time I played, I went up to bat and the guy hit me dead center in the shoulder blades and I took my helmet off and I took my bat and I laid it down and I walked off the field and I said, I'm never doing that again. Cause if I can't run out in the f- end of the pitcher and hit him with yeah. my bat, cause he yeah. just hit me with a ball. This makes no sense. Yeah. That's the truth. And, uh, so I never played baseball. Well, I pretty much fell out of favor, you know, not and it wasn't like he treated me bad, but and this isn't to pull on anyone's heartstrings or anything, but my dad would get up and make my brother's breakfast and he wouldn't make me breakfast because mm. I didn't play ball. Um, I didn't, you know, it's one of those things like you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. It wasn't until yeah. I got older that I realized my dad made him breakfast and he didn't make me anything, you know, and I didn't whine, whine, whine about it or anything else. And then like when I went off to school, you know, dad just focused on education. Well, then everybody in the family used it against me because I was the only one that got a degree. Mm. Well, I'm sitting here going, I just did what dad told me to. It wasn't like I walk around like, oh, look at me. I've got five degrees. I got degrees because dad said, you're going to get this. And then you're going to, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. And he was kind enough to pay for it. Then that got turned against me. Mm. My entire family ostracized me. I have no relationship with any of my family. So it's one of those things that the education got used against me as if I was better than everybody else when all I was doing was what dad said, just like my brother. He was one of the first guys in, in Florida to sign uh, a professional career out of high school. He was that good. Baseball? Baseball. Damn. He signed with the Houston Astros at, at a high school. No shit. And then went to Colorado Rockies and stuff like that. So um, he played? At yeah. The, yeah. He, he right. never made triple. He never made majors. He got up to triple. Okay. But I mean, he was a shit. I mean, he was good. You know, he's, he's just yeah, that naturally. Yeah, so good. To, Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I didn't minimize it, but just wasn't my cup of tea. But um, at the end of the day, it's... It, as you said, it took kind of a, co- I have a completely different perspective. I think that's part of what makes me a better coach is I understand that not everybody is cookie cutter one way or the other. Yeah. Um, I'm not afraid to anybody who's a client of mine that's listening to this podcast knows we always start by finding your weaknesses and boy, that doesn't make and people they're happy. Fun, yeah. They're not fun. And I try to find them physically. I try to find them mentally and try to serve you as a coach to make sure that we're the best you can be given the circumstances that you're dealing with. Sometimes yeah. it's, I, you know, it's probably not something that, you know, it's recently off of a five year divorce. You know, I, I lost my ass. Um, it, like you say, it's about perspective. It's about looking back going, how'd I get here? Yeah. You know, I just tried to be my kid's dad and that just wasn't good enough. And I'll even go on to say taking on Dungey is pretty much what ended my marriage looking back. Um, could I change it? No. Cause there was other issues there. That was just the last yeah. nail on the column. But I have a different perspective. When I say that these are your kids before they're your elite athletes, don't lose sight of that. You know, I have their privilege of working with a lot of these guys. They don't have relationships with their parents. They're commodities. It's crazy, isn't it? It is. It really is. And I don't get along with parents like that because I call them out. 
Yeah. You know, I, I don't deal with physical hitting. I don't deal with, I mean, you could be disturbed and a, a little bit frustrated, but they're still your children first. Yeah. And, you know. And like what race means that much that you want to damage your kid? Because the no. thing is like, as as weird as the whole Tony Alessi, Mike Alessi thing is, yeah. and like, I'm sure Mike gets to the age, there was a definitive age where Mike's like, dude, he's a fucking kook. Like, Absolutely. He's still his dad, man. Yeah. And you, no matter what, like you look up to your dad. Like, well, and you're walking in a sport that's mocking your dad in yeah. to your face. I don't know anybody that could deal with I couldn't even begin to be imagine so what that felt like. so bizarre what I he just, had to go through. Yeah. And, you know, his dad showing up with Believe the Hype. And it's not like Mike ran down to the printer and had those No, he done. didn't screen print those shows. No. And then all of a sudden, you know, that was a laughing stock. And Mike's probably walking around going, what's everybody talking about? You know, because. Dude, that's like the one, you know, the one thing that if, if someone had to ask me, like, the one thing that I've learned out of doing this podcast. Yeah. It's like, just don't talk shit. Right. Because like, and the people that would talk shit on me, I'm like, well, you actually don't know what's right. going on. Like yeah. what you're saying is like factually incorrect. Yep. And you're saying it from a position of like seeing just the tiniest part of the picture, Yep. you know, where it's like, you know, you get people like, Oh, you could tell he didn't like, the, you could tell that he didn't like him in that interview. And I'm like, the dude's literally my friend. Right. Like he's one of my best friends. And like, you get some dude that's get re- willing to say that, like, oh, you could tell he doesn't actually like it. I'm yeah. like, motherfucker, he's like my family. Yeah. But then that would, because I was one of those people that would like, would diss the Alessi thing sure. and like rip on him and talk about the shirts. But it's not until you're in a position where like you're someone that people are looking at from the outside in and then they're getting that stuff wrong and you're like, whoa, you're all getting this fucking wrong. Yeah, absolutely. And that Michael Lessie believe the hype shit is yep. the perfect example yep. because Mike didn't go to the printers and get that That's done. That's right. <laughs> and I like didn't like Michael Lessie because of the shirts. Right. And I, now I've got this perspective of like, that poor kid didn't make those shirts. That's right. And that's what he was. He was a kid. Yep. And, and there's like, I think when it comes to like that criticism thing that- I don't in any way, like I, I had a, well, you get, I get messages from people that listen to the show and I think I'm like, dude, you think that this is something other than it is right. like, I'm just still a fucking dude that's trying to figure shit out. Yep. Like it's extremely normal. And I don't consider myself to be anything more than just the person I was before the start. Like nothing's changed. Yep. It's just now people listen to a conversation. That's right. But people do think that kind of stuff you know what i mean yeah. and and I, I think that it's that's one perspective and like maybe you have to do this kind of thing and then get that kind of criticism to get that perspective but if that's like one thing i could like give to people yeah where you could like take something from without having to go through learned sure. experience that's what i would tell people is like we have to stop this like culture of like talking shit yeah. and judgment and like expecting that because you're watching something on TV or reading it in a magazine or, you know, like seeing some, some shit that you're making a judgment on. Like they're just people. Yeah. They're just people. That's right. That are going, and like, and now thinking back what I would think about the Alessis and think sure. about that. I'm like, dude, that's just a kid. That's yeah. just a poor kid. And then like, even with Tony, who knows what kind of fucked up life he had. Exactly. Because if you're the kind of person that's going to like have a kid, like go into kids, r- trash your relationship. Not that I even know that happened, but he was sure, a single sure. dad yep. that took custody of the kids, turn them into these motocross. Like there's some weird shit that's obviously happened in his life. That's, that's right. not a normal thing to do. That's right. So it's like it, that's been like this really big learning thing for me doing this. And I wish I knew it sooner. Sure is that it's so easy to comment on people that you you kind of get like this weird window like you're not you're not actually like say for instance like the podcast you yeah. sit down you're sort of watching like this 2 hour window like you're just looking through a window yeah. and that's like it's the whole picture you see mm-hmm. but that's not the same thing and no. our conversation today started from the airport absolutely and it started with email and it's so i don't know it's just like it's it's been enlightening a bit lately to like really see that from like through my own lived experience sure. now and now i'm like really trying to just apply that and i still find myself making judgment and, and sure. shit like that but it, it's something i'm really working on now is to like you just don't know that 
the story and you don't see the full perspective. Exactly. I said to, I said to Mikhail at the airport today, I said, we, you know, you walk by so many people. I said, everybody's got a story. Yeah. They were coming off the plane and we we're getting ready to get back on. And I said, everybody, because everybody's so unique. I love mm. being in Australia because it's definitely a Different. more of a, well, it's a definitely more of a melting pot than I've seen in the States even. Mm. It's kind of interesting. I mean, just all over the place. And, you know, the thing that I think is interesting in the old days, people would say, you know, duplication is the finest form of compliment. Now with social media changing the dynamics of that, everybody's got an opinion. And I've, I've come to, yeah, I have very thick skin. I don't care what somebody says because I sleep very good at night. Mm. If I discontinue a relationship with somebody, I know it's for the right reasons. For a reason, yeah. Not my panties are in a wad and I'd, somebody said something crass, I could care less. I have a responsibility. And I'm going to serve that responsibility. And if it doesn't concur with what you want, you have a choice. Yeah. You can either stay or you can go. And you obviously know your why, why you're doing it. Like you've fleshed it out to the point where you can be okay with it. But when you got somebody that jumps on social media that wants to dog on you, Mm. and I've read some of the comments that people have said, number one, how bad does your life have to be that you're going to take valuable time out of your schedule Mm. to sit and write a negative comment? Just freaking move on. Yeah. I don't care if it's a thumbs down or a comment. Just move on. It's so weird, though, that, like, that stuff, though, it's funny because, like, the I put up the Chad video, like, where he talks about him and James, which I think was, like, a brilliant piece of insight Absolutely. into a guy that's never talked about that. Right. Right? And and the, the thing is, like, oh, you're interrupting and this and that. It's a conversation. Like, and I'm trying to get stuff out of him. That's right. And like, if I let him, it, you, people don't realize that like, even with a, with Chad that's in the podcast, he's got so many years mm-hmm. of the spiel. Yes. Like you said, the Thor parts unlimited. You just made Ooh, it sound yeah. so smooth over time. If you let these guys go and you don't keep digging, then you see it all the time. That's right. You'll, stay, you'll stay start, superficial. Yeah, way you'll up start, here. they'll start good and they'll start out like on topic. Yep. And then they slowly start to give you this cookie cutter answer that feels very comfortable. That's right. They don't want to invite this kind of stuff. Like I'm sure Chad doesn't really want to like go that deep into it. Like that's where you, that's where you've or, got to keep going. Or you is know? he trepidatious to go there thinking that it may be too much for your show and it's your show and he's yeah, trying to show exactly, respect. Yeah. And if all of a sudden you start, you just asked me some questions that no one's asked. That's because you're wanting to take it somewhere. There has to be some mutual respect. If I'm not comfortable, I appreciate mm. you saying that. If you don't want to go there, cool. Yeah. Well, for Chad, he may want to get on the cusp of that. May have done it in the past, got his head slammed because yeah, it was exactly, too yeah. volatile. Yeah. Now you're so for the again the keyboard warrior that wants to sit there and say quit interrupting. You've never done this before. Yeah. You're a professional. You've done this on the front of the camera, the back of the camera for umpteen years. You know, I have my own podcast. I didn't go start it myself. I have David Iser. He's the mm. producer. He asks the questions. We discuss framework, but that's what he does. I'm not sitting here telling him how to do it. Mm. I haven't been in my own show for however many years DMX has been out there, 20 plus years. Mm. You're a professional interviewer. You're but not, it's not, I don't, I don't even think I am though. Like but you what are I am without is real, like, but you're a friend and you're somebody, you're a dude that's in the sport yeah. who says, look, I know a little bit more. Come on, talk to me. Yeah, Let me exactly. rephrase that question. So yep. you go a little bit deeper. And like you say, for the person that's listening, that's a gift. Don't mm. sit here and bash me about it be fortunate enough that I was able to get him to keep going yeah. deep if I have to interrupt him to do it but again everybody is a you know everybody's it's, a pro it's that just not seeing the whole picture and that's like I've like wrote back to some comments on it and there's it's like that dude doing the interview I'm like this isn't an interview that's for right for starters no. like you're calling this an interview what's to say this is an interview where no. does it say anywhere on any of these shows it's like gypsy tales podcast right and it's me doing whatever the fuck i want yeah and it's free yeah i put it you know what yeah. i mean like Isn't that there's the no truth? there's yes. no like i don't see where the expectation comes from people it's like you've stopped by right you watch it you like it you don't exactly you like it keep watching you don't move on well I'll, I'll put myself on the hot seat here you know you invited me to come up it was i was in awe i was honored mm. You've been around the sport for forever. Yes, we know a lot of same people, but we've had conversations from the airport. We've had conversations on the podcast that I've never done with anybody before. It was a privilege that you would ask me to come in, but it may not be of any value to somebody. Great, move on to the next one. Yeah. Don't sit here and write 42 comments about what a jerk he is and he's arrogant and he name drop. Wow, wow, wow. Move on. Yeah. 
you know, the guy that was bitching about your Chad Reed comment probably just bought one t-shirt and thinks he's a Chad Reed fan. Mm. Couldn't even tell you what Yamaha Choi is, yeah. much less what year he came over. He didn't even know his wife and, you know, his dad disowned him because he chose Ellie and they came up. You know, screw you, dude. Yeah. You think you're this consummate professional and you don't even know what you're... That's the kind where I like it, where the other listeners just tear him up yeah. when he puts a stupid ass comment up like that. But the thing is, like, is it... It's... I get, I get messages all the time of people that say, like, they mention the most random part mm-hmm. of a random podcast yep. that they're like, dude, this fully changed how I see everything. Absolutely. And I'm like, oh, that was a passing comment. Yep. To me, that's a thing that I don't think a lot about. Yep. That's a thing that I just naturally do. Yeah. To that guy, that was this huge thing. Yeah. I've had that in podcasts where I've listened to and I'm like, holy shit. That just blew my world. Yeah. And I'm in a car like with uh, like Jeremy Malott from yep. Red Bulls, like one yep. of my best friends. Awesome we guy. listen to podcasts awesome all the time guy. together. And he's like, dude, what are you like? What's the big deal? Yeah. But everyone's got their own. You know what I mean? Sure. Like, everyone should take their own things out of everything in life. Look for don't just like it's like go for what you expect it should be. Like have an open mind to what well, it is. Ask the why. That's, yeah. you know, I, I say this every day when I get a client that comes in from another, another program, I always start with, why did you do that? Mm. Not because I'm trying to show that they, what they did was wrong, but can you at least shed some light on the intention of that workout? Like I said yeah. earlier, Monday contributes to the seven days. That seven days contributes to a training cycle and that training cycle fits into some part of a periodization, preseason, pre-competitive, competitive phase one, two, or whatever understand why and mm. I always challenge and I'll challenge anyone who's watching the podcast if you're on a program I'm not asking you to hire us I'm asking you to ask why yeah go back to your coach go back to your trainer whatever you these titles I even like anymore because everybody's a coach everyone's yeah. a professional right everybody's got a podcast yeah, everybody's got a podcast <laughs> now gosh everybody's an interviewer that's right and, and my big thing is why are you doing it yeah you know Michaela and I talk about it like why are we coming over because I want to get to a group of people that have been asking us to come over for a while and give back to them a little bit more. And there's some fear there. I mean, we haven't sold it out 100% yet. I know there's some people there that are on the fence, but I guarantee you, I'm going to go out there and talk as if there's a full house or mm. if there's 15 people out there. Yeah. Because I want them to have that aha moment where they're like, that's why I get, let's call it late moto fatigue. That's why I have a yeah. nervous stomach. Maybe somebody's working in a mode of fear instead of a proactive. Like you said just two minutes ago, something's going to click and it'll be that aha moment. And you don't know what that is. It'll make the entire yeah. 25 days that we've been away from home worthwhile because mm. we're hosting two camps. It'll be worthwhile. It's not about me. That's the part that I don't like about these performance coaches that are out there. They want to get in, you know, they'll get all ticked off if their rider doesn't mention them on the podium. I'm like, if you do, that's a gift. Yeah. You're not in- obligated. Especially like you said at the very start, like they're paying you. Yeah. Like that's, that's where I think it definitely, a guy like Alden, and I'm friends with Alden, yeah. so, and I've said it a bunch of yep. times, like uh, the talk with it, it comes up, but I think it's, it's inevitable that when you're at the top, people are going to talk about you. It's Absolutely. just the nature of the beast. Yep. And, and that's how everything is whether you're a celebrity or that. you get close to the top more people talk about you that's right but it's like you know you get to maybe it's like Alden set this weird bar because I don't think he was ever the guy that wanted to go out there and he's not posting on Instagram every day and he's not like Alden really isn't that guy like Alden's very interested in what's going on he's got his way of thinking and he wants to get results he wants to get what's in his brain to those riders and then to win championship that's like he's got this pathway that's what he wants to explore and he's a perfectionist in that whether it's right or wrong whether like it doesn't matter but that's what that's his why that's what he's doing it for and I think that he was the first guy that had these dudes just win and win and win and elevate the sport to this level that that came with people talking about him so then I think think that set this standard for these other coaches and trainers to like be in the limelight yeah because like Alden was in the limelight Mm -hmm. but I don't ever think Alden like sought out that limelight so I think that what followed is a bunch of people that wanted to get on the podium and yeah. be mentioned by riders and be talked about by riders like magazines wanted to interview them I right th- I think a coach I think Alden was a cultural shift to where these trainers wanted to sort of be there yeah and get that but again like dude Alden they're paying him hundreds of thousands of dollars mm-hmm. but now then you've got the Troy Adamitis that's like wants to dive deep into that and he 
Troy did your C- the CBS yes. thing that you yeah yep. so you know he's going in so it sort of brings these guys into the limelight yep once you get it, I've been guilty of it myself. Sure. Now I've got th- like hundreds of thousands of people that watch. Yep. And you can't help but wonder what that shit's like. Absolutely. You can't help but like, you know, look in like I had, I've had a bunch of people hit me up that are like really cool fucking people. And yeah. I'm like, well, I've got to try and stay humble. Sure. But inside sure. I'm like, this is sick. It's incredible. You yeah. know? Yeah. So it's, again, that's that human nature side of things. But yeah, I think, I think that was like a weird shift that, that happened well, here's what's interesting, you know, for anybody who's been around the sport for a long period of time, let's not forget that Jeff Spencer brought this concept to our sport mm. with the Honda team. You know, he was brought in originally, that's all he did was the Honda team. And for whatever reason, I've heard multitude of, of stories as to why he moved on and all that other stuff. But, you know, Alden was probably the first one, obviously working with Ricky, but let's not forget, Alden was brought in through Johnny O'Mara. Mm. Johnny O'Mara comes from the Honda days. So what Johnny learned both on his own as an athlete, self-studying, plus under the toolage of Jeff Spencer. I think he was with Jeff at that time. I may be wrong with that. But that's where it all started. Yeah, but I think that Alden coincided with the new age of Totally agree, totally agree. And that's where I think it's interesting if you look at, it's not, what I was trying to clarify is, it's not that Alden brought some new idea. Yeah. It brought a cultural shift. Yeah. But that California Jeff Spencer team Honda set the tone for it. Then that kind of manifested itself then I think, and in, in all fairness, you know, um, I remember shortly before I picked up Dungey, everything in California was these portable VO2 Max machines. Mm. So people are running around the track trying to promote these VO2 Maxes. So weird, eh? That's another conversation. Mixed Master 3000. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and the point of that is, is now they're sitting here running around. Now they're an expert. They know yeah. how to regurgitate a report that comes out of some machine that you breathe in. Then everybody buys into a hook, line, and sinker. Then, you know, then... My point is this: the trainers start to get a bad rap because they're, you know, they're, they're snake, oil, snake so, oil guys. Absolutely, and they were, and they they got called out, and they should have been. I will take my performance reports to anybody and everybody and say, "Here, yeah, let's talk about it." Yeah. I had to do it to prove credibility to Ricky to bring our program to his place. You know, I everywhere I had to do it to Dungey. I mean, I had to go up and interview with Dungey. It was a two month process. Mm. I had to show him there was a system. I had to show him there was a process. I needed to make sure that I could adjust. I was perfectly fine saying, Dungey, it's not a good fit. But what he was going through and where he was at, I knew we could fix that. Once we fixed that and he decided he needed something different and more, that was great. And the opportunity came up because Villapoto had retired. And like you said, he had believed in it. I like that word you said. He had the faith in it. Yeah. It's like being in a bad relationship. I can't make you love me. Yeah. You see who I am and it is what it is. Maybe that comes from the adoption thing. I mean, my biggest fear in life is being abandoned. Mm. I've been abandoned twice. Okay. It's the most paralyzing fear I have. But just because I have that doesn't mean Dunge has that. Mm. And so, like you said earlier, where, where you meet people where they're at, I wasn't going to sit here beg and grovel for Dunge to stay. He needed to move on. That's where yeah, his that's heart his was at. Thing. That was his faith. He put faith in me for a duration of time. Maybe I didn't present things exactly the way he wanted it. And I may, and I'll use the word failed. I didn't maybe give him enough information for him to see it. And maybe that gave him a reason, but it, I could have probably done it to a T and he probably would have saw that Villapoto moved on. Oh yeah. And would have no been doubt, over, or maybe yeah. it was Roxon at the time. Wasn't it Roxon? Yeah, went, I think it was Roxon. Excuse that, me. It was yeah, Roxon yeah. when Roxon and AC vacated. He went and I'm like, we talked about it on the phone. I'll never forget it. I was driving back, you know, and, and I was cool with that because it's like a bad relationship. I'm not, I can't beg yeah. you to stay. You've made up your mind. You're moving on. Dude, best of luck. Yeah. He's a great guy. I love him and Lindsay both. You know, they're great people. Uh, that guy Spencer that I told you about that I worked with, he was Dungy's best man. It's a small little world, man. Yeah, yeah. You just, it's a small little, in fact, if it wasn't for Spencer, probably Dunge would have never called me. Yeah. Because the first time I met Dunge, ironically, I had picked Spencer up at the airport and he traveled home. This is when Dunge was training with Stuart. Oh, yeah. And I had a human... I completely forgot he trained with Stuart. Yeah, and I had a facility about three miles from Stuart's place. It was a yeah. it was a winter training facility. Spencer was with me. Dunge was training with uh, Stuart. Dunge goes out to Vegas, and that's when he stuck a wheel in on, Dun- on Stuart. And that's the next time Stuart showed... Excuse me. The next time Dunge showed up at the front door, his stuff was at the gate. He was no longer welcome because he stuck that's a wheel on crazy, him. Crazy, eh? So my point in all of that is, you know, with... I go to I pick I pick uh, Spencer and Dunge up at the airport. Dunge doesn't know me. I really didn't know of Dunge to be honest with you. Nobody did. We mm. knew Suzuki scooped him up. We know Roger, you know, plucked him out of the B class, but nobody really knew of him. 
and we went to Olive Garden of all places and I had two little itty bitty guys at the time and we're sitting there eating dinner and Dunn just sitting across from me and then it's Spence and, and my boys and I just looked at Dunn and I said man what do you want to do in the sport and he looks me straight in the eyes and didn't flinch and said I want to beat every record Ricky ever did that's sick eh? and I didn't know Dungy the sport didn't know Dungy everybody thought DeCostro had lost his marbles mm. and he looked me straight in the eyes and said that didn't winch there wasn't you know Dunn she's not yeah, there's yeah. not an arrogant bone in his body and I thought wow I even said to my little guy Josh when I left I said wow I mean this guy knows what he wants I didn't see it as arrogance I was like this guy's yeah. laser focused then the stuff went down with James he moved up to Ricky's place and then the rest is history from there Yeah. and yeah it's easy to sit back 15 years later now yeah Josh is 19 damn that's crazy yeah. eh? goes and, by so quick but you look at it look back to look forward yeah we know I remember sitting there with dinner with Dunge recently Simon Suzuki now retired one of may go down as one of the most successful racers that were out yeah. there you know and, and rightfully so yeah he's in it had a good head game and, and really did his job so it's just really cool to see how far it's come and you know when people take accountability and responsibility as we discussed it yeah. uh life could be a much better place so we're three hours we killed it this was Sweet. an amazing podcast Sweet. i had so much fun Thank uh, you for i think me. i learned a lot awesome. um so shout out to your school because i think there's still some places available yep. uh, and if anyone has any trouble contacting you message me and i'll yeah, put you guys in, in contact um but it's at mount kembla in sydney uh so you take away the rest and then websites and instagrams yeah and, absolutely uh, yeah it's been awesome talking to you and thanks for uh, having me wealth of knowledge and a resource for anyone out there actually now nah, before we go what would you say we'll try and do a little short thing yeah but for like, say we've got your average dude listening right now that like is just racing to to have fun on the weekends. What, where should you start with fitness? Like if you've, you know, you work a job, what would be the most beneficial way for you to train to be just your average motocross guy? I think it goes back to what we said earlier. Pull back on the intensity. You know, if you're working a 12, 15 hour job, let's say it's physical labor, then you've got a family and you've got all this and then you're going to the gym and just lighten it up you know it's it falls into that trap we said earlier a lot of guys think the only way to go fast is to go fast all the time it's kind of like sticking your bike in second gear and going out and ride Glen Helen and never changing gears and wonder why the bio, motor mm. blows change the gear don't be afraid to pull back I, I find that most athletes especially amateurs are training 10 times more than the pros are mm. You know, I'm not. I'm, and then it fades away because the body just gets so beat up over time. Well, you know, you said it yourself. You're hyper competitive. So if, mm. if two's not working, you're going to go to four. Four's yeah. not working, you're going to go to eight. And then eventually you're just going to blow up. Well, that's like with me, my training. Like I literally would go like I could go th- at the start. Yeah. I could go three days a week. Yep. And that was it. My yep. body was cooked. And then as soon as I got fit enough to do three days a week, I was doing four days that's a week. That's right. And then as soon as that was normal, I was doing five days a week. Yeah. And then I was doing six days a week. And then I was chucking dr- drilling sessions in. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, you just get into this place where it's like whatever you can handle, you'll just, you just put yourself in that hurt locker yep. and you just take what you can take, what you can take That's basically right. and just keep going. But it's, it's not sustainable. Well, it, it goes back to like we said, and this does, I, I said it in the car, it sounds so cliche-ish. The definition of overtraining is simply doing more than your body can absorb. Mm. When you started three days was all you could absorb, then four. The problem is, is when you find that you can do four, maybe five days, keep 50% of that aerobic mm. and you'll catapult to a completely different level because you build more capillary beds. You, inc- you start to leverage more stored body fat for fuel. You start to teach yourself to burn more fuel from fat than sugar. You decrease the cortisol production of high oxidative stress associated with high heart rate, mm. high intensity. Yeah. You don't have the free radical production. You don't have all that that metabolic damage going on inside. All of a sudden people will start feeling better and they're like, wow, I pull back and I feel 100% better. Yeah. It's because you're, you work a job, you're a dad, you're a husband, you're, or it could go both genders. But the idea here is pull back because mm. I love my job because I very rarely have to paddle, cattle prod somebody. Yeah. They've got that desire. Yeah, you've just it's gotta, just about funneling yeah. it. And then getting them to trust it. And the only way to get them to trust it is to see quantified results. And then I've got athletes I've had 10, 15 years because their goals just keep getting bigger and more ambitious. Mm. Whether it's moving out of the sport of moto and going into rock climbing, going into kayaking. I mean, face it, as fit as you are, what can't you do? I'm not, I'm not trying to put you on the spot. Mm. You know, but you get a, no disrespect, my brother was a baseball player, as I said, take a baseball player put him on a motorcycle yeah, he sucks. but yeah give me a motorcycle racer put yeah. him in a baseball bat he's gonna hit it and be able to run yeah but the baseball player probably won't make it around the track without falling yeah and he won't go very fast yeah 
but yet you as a racer you can go wakeboarding yeah. you can go rock climbing yeah, you can true. do jujitsu that's the cool part yeah so yeah shout out this camp um, how people can get involved with it and then where people can sort of find you in general yeah uh, the safest place if you're a racer uh, you can go to complete racing solutions.com and uh, up on the top there you'll see where it says resources we've got that's where the Australian camp information is um, for people that are listening to the podcast for the first time don't know me from Adam just go to coach Rob with two B's dot com and there you can kind of scroll down and find your sport of choice and then it takes you to your own sport specific uh, website and then what we've got is each website has its own standalone YouTube channel with its own sports specific flexibility, strength, nutrition, and sports psychology. And then social media just follows it. So like complete triathlon solutions.com is also the same Instagram account. It's the same, yeah, all cool. of that. So very, try to keep it as simple as possible. And again, man, thanks for having me. It's been and awesome. where's the info for the camp? The it's camp? right there on the complete racing solutions.com okay, cool. uh, up on the top tab. You'll see where it says uh, resources and you click on that and the Australian camp is right there. Awesome. Well, uh, yeah, I've really enjoyed it, man. It's awesome. Been, been awesome. I'm glad you guys made the trip up. Thank you up so much. And, uh, we'll do it again for sure. We'll make it happen. Awesome. Thanks, brother.